What a year it has been. Our lives have been disrupted in so many dramatic and profound ways. Not only are we reckoning with an ongoing global pandemic, unlike any before seen in our lifetime, but also a racial wake-up call that has jarred the American conscious. The economic and social fallouts have been substantial. Hello, I'm Mayor William Wild. As the pandemic began to take hold, it became clear that people of color were dying at a much higher rate than white people in the United States. Lack of access to health care and economic resources hit minority communities especially hard. These realities, along with others, have highlighted that we cannot turn a blind eye to the deep-rooted racial issues and unconscious cultural biases that face every community, even Westland. In August of 2020, the Westland City Council voted unanimously to join other communities in adopting a resolution declaring racism is a public health crisis, and I stand in support of the resolution as well. The resolution called on the mayor to seat a commission whose work would be to conduct an assessment of internal policy and procedures to ensure that racial equity is a core element in every aspect of the City of Westland's organization. The Commission would also work to create an equity and justice oriented organization by identifying specific activities to increase diversity and to incorporate anti-racism principles across leadership, staffing, and contracting. The City Council and Administration pledged to work with the Commission to incorporate into the organization educational efforts to address and dismantle racism, expand understanding of racism and how racism affects individual and population health. In January, I appointed a very talented, diverse seven-member board with two alternates to the City of Westland's first Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Commission, whose work has already begun and their meetings are always open to the public. You can find the Commission's meeting schedule on the City's website. Prior to the new DEI Commission's inaugural meeting, the City hosted a Saturday workshop via Zoom to bring the City Administration, the City Council, the DEI Commission, and the public together so that we could begin on this journey together. The workshop was moderated by Scott Patton from Plant Moran and we heard presentations from the Michigan Municipal League on how they, as a 100-year-old organization, are also committed to diversity, equity, and inclusion, and what some other Michigan communities are doing as well. It is our responsibility as local leaders to actively listen and engage with all of our residents. If real change is going to happen, it is time for us to seize this moment. So sit back and enjoy this groundbreaking discussion. Well, good morning, everyone. I think uh, you guys can hear me, so I see eyes lifting up from their screens. Uh, so it is 9.30. Uh, we'll get going. I'd like to first uh, really quick welcome all of our guests for joining, as well as all of my colleagues who are here. Um, we also have some folks that uh, came from Plant Moran, and uh, we also have all of our, uh, a number of our members from our new DEI board. Uh, so without further ado, I want to turn things right over to the mayor. Uh, so he can uh, introduce our guests and uh, lead us on this discussion. So, Mayor. All right. Well, thank you, uh, Council President Hart. And uh, as uh, the Council President said, welcome, everybody. And um, today we're going to be kicking off uh, the first of five strategic planning sessions uh, with uh, the City Council, the administration. Um, we, it's been a long time since the city's actually done uh, formal strategic planning sessions. It probably uh, the last that we've that we've really done it in a in a formal sense was uh, post the recession, and um, I think the timing uh, coming out of well as we're working our way through COVID and then coming out of COVID, um, I think that uh, that the timing is perfect to uh, really take a deep dive into. Uh, take a strategic plan, look at a lot of different areas that affect the city. And I appreciate the city council's uh, willingness to be part of this. And um, today's session is gonna focus on uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And then uh, we have a rough schedule of upcoming events. We're try gonna try to do them one per month. Uh, the next uh, meeting will be in January, uh, date to be determined, place to be determined time. Uh, but we're gonna do a strategic session on finance. We'll come back in February and do a strategic uh, 
session on public safety. Uh, then our next one in March will be on infrastructure. And then we're going to close out in April on economic development. And uh, I'll be working with, with staff and council president and um, Plan Moran to make sure that each and every one of these uh, sessions are um, that they bring value and that we cover a, a broad range of, uh, of areas. And um, so for, for those of us, that, for those that are in their first time, uh, you know, the strategic planning sessions are, are typically less formal than, than a city council meeting or even a city council study session. So, um, and, and they're meant to be that way so that there's a, uh, an easy, uh, you know, back and forth of communication. And um, so um, if you, if you, feel like it's a little less structured than maybe one of our study sessions that that's kind of the plan. And typically when we do these, we actually try to go off site so that we can kind of change, uh, change the background and, and the environment. So obviously uh, for this meeting, we're gonna have to do COVID, but when I look at everybody's backgrounds, we got a nice little mix of uh, backgrounds. So it certainly doesn't feel like we're sitting in the city council chambers. Um, for the uh, strategic planning sessions, um, we're going to be uh, partnering with uh, Plant Moran and Scott Patton, who's going to be coming on here in a few minutes. He's going to be uh, facilitating uh, the different sessions, and, and Scott has uh, been doing this for a long time. He's very well respected. Um, he's been uh, actually gearing up to do a second round of strategic planning uh, with uh, Grand Rapids and um, Alicia Watkins is on the line here today too. You know, she does our work uh, heading up our audit for Plan Miranda. She's uh, the account representative and, and she's on the line today too, if, if needed. And our for, former account rep, uh, Mike Schwartz, uh, speaks very highly of uh, Scott's talents as well. So um, we're looking forward to his, uh, his help to get us through these five sessions. Um, today's session, uh, as you can see, when you look when you look out at your screen, uh, we have, I believe we have the entire uh, Westland City Council online. We have uh, my administrations online. I think other than MJ and um, Stephanie, the rest are in the role of participants. Uh, city clerk's on with us today. Um, and our DEI members are with us today too. And I was going to say their names once, uh, I believe all but two are with us today, uh, but their names are Elnora Ford, Lena Nichols, Arthur Warren, Angela Rummel, Fabiola Sanchez Santos, Denise Sedman, Dr. Mohammed Almini, Ebonite Guyton, and Stephen Thomas. And at the last city council meeting, I went into a little bit about, about each of their backgrounds. So um, I'm not going to do that here today. Um, and then, Another thing is uh, we're going to be hearing from two members of the MML today. I know that Scott has already given you their um, their bios and are Kelly Warren and Selma Tucker. And anybody that, that's been involved with MML certainly knows Kelly. I know a lot of the, the city council members have participated in the elected officials academy and some of the weekenders and other things. And Kelly's been involved in a lot of different levels and Selma uh, is an extremely talented individual that, that uh, MML was fortunate to, to get their hands on. And he's going to be talking about what his role is and how he thinks he can or how he knows he's going to be able to help communities like Westland as we uh, navigate uh, the importance of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, so I want to just touch on uh, the resolution that, that was created by the city council uh, declaring racism as a public health crisis. Um, it was uh, brought to the city council by Councilwoman Tasha Green. I believe it was um, initially authored by Michigan United, and we may have some of those folks on with us today as well. And I believe it was introduced uh, at the state level by Senator Geis, who's Westland's state senator, and Senator Marshall Bullock from Detroit. Um, there was a study session. There was input from the local civic leaders um, and a lot of public input. And in a relatively short period of time, the West Sand City Council uh, came to unanimous uh, support uh, of this uh, resolution in August. And out of that, um, with the creation of the DEI board, um, the resolution is something that I support. Uh, my entire administration will be supporting it. And, and I know that as we, as we go into uh, 
uh, the importance of dec diversity, equity, inclusion. I know that my executive staff is 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 one area that we need to work on. Uh, the current makeup of of my on the website we break it down executive and administrative, but it's basically the administration. Um, Why we do have diversity as far as gender goes, and uh, we do have representation from the Arab American community. And we just recently lost our library director who was from Pakistanian descent, uh, but there's currently um, the highest ranking uh, um, administrator on our staff that's African American as our newly appointed IT director. Uh, but in the past we have had African Americans in prominent, very prominent spots. Uh, as high as deputy mayor, uh, deputy police chief, DPS director, parks and recreation director, and economic development. So we're committed to, as the opportunity presents itself, to continue diversifying uh, my staff as well. Um, for the DEI board, uh, we this was a new board that was uh, created uh, by resolution. We hadn't had one in the city's past, so what we did is we kind of used a lot of the language. We mirrored the uh, ethics board, which was created from ordinance and we have a seven member board with two alternates. Uh, their terms are staggered in the beginning uh, so that they're not all up at the same time. And then as their uh, terms are up for renewal, uh, a, a renewal will be uh, for three years in, in each spot. There was a lot of interest from the public and I'm very proud of the, the board that we have today. They're extremely talented individuals and, and passionate, but I think we have a, a good mix of ethnicity, gender, age, and the, the geographic area that they live in the city. So we've asked them to uh, participate here today and they're gonna actually have a chance to kind of to weigh in a little bit later in the, the meeting. And at this point, we're scheduling their first meeting to be in January. Uh, our HR director, Stephanie Field, will, will serve as the administrative liaison to uh, the, the group as they get started. And she's actually going to be uh, speaking to us here uh, just uh, shortly about some of the things that uh, she's already been been working on in preparation. So, with that, I'm going to read a short bio from Scott on Scott Patton, and we're going to officially kick off today's session. Um, Scott is a government operations practice leader for Plant Moran. In that role, he assists a variety of local governments and state government agencies. He helps government work better by focusing on how resources are organized how processes are designed, and how technology can improve their operations. His client base is varied, ranging from villages as small as 1,500 residents to cities as large as Philadelphia, Detroit, Cleveland, and Grand Rapids. Scott has worn many hats over the years and has experienced government as an internal practitioner, an external consultant, an elected policymaker, and like me, a clueless resident. I like that, Scott. He remains active in his community by volunteering in a variety of civic and community activities, including as treasurer for Adoption Associates Incorporated, which recently celebrated placing its 5,000th child into her new family. That, that's really awesome. Scott earned his bachelor's degree in philosophy from Hope College and his master's degree in public administration from Michigan State University. So Scott, the, the baton is officially passed to you. Thank you. All right. Th thank you so much, Mayor. Um, yeah, so uh, uh, as Mayor mentioned, we have a series of strategic sessions that are planned with, uh, uh, with council. And um, uh, there's a total of five of them, roughly speaking, one per month. And just to get you within the context of how that um, uh, uh, would all work is that, you know, the mayor is going to come to council with recommendations related to budget for the 21-22 uh, budget uh, in April. And so uh, the sessions will help inform um, uh, both what the development of that is, as well as, you know, some considerations that council uh, 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 may have uh, uh, as it relates to that. Um, so I've been working with mayor and um, uh, council president for the last month or so to help design uh, the ordering and the um, uh, uh, potential content for those particular sessions. Um, and we're kind of starting off today with uh, uh, diversity 
uh, equity and inclusion. Um, uh, for those in the public, you'll hear that reference throughout the meeting as, uh, uh, as DEI. And as uh, uh, Mayor mentioned, you know, there has been action that has been taken by, um, uh, by council already um, in the creation of a commission, most of the members of whom are here today. And um, uh, the, so the purpose of today's session is, you know, kind of, again, thinking strategically, thinking long-term, thinking about how it is that um, uh, uh, things might, you know, uh, uh, be modified, shifted for the, uh, 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 for the city. Um, you know, council unanimously approved that uh, the establishment of the commission, uh, the appointments happened and, um, uh, you know, the resolution itself, that's, that, that's a moving resolution. It's, uh, you know, you're tackling a very, very big problem. Included in it were some components about how, um, uh, how the commission might operate uh, related to, you know, frequency of meetings and, you know, the necessity of reviewing city policies and the like. Um, but again, it's a really, really big, uh, uh, big problem. And so because it's big, there's kind of a thousand different ways that the commission could go to try to uh, 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 try to tackle it. And so today what we wanna do is help help narrow the focus a little bit, give them some guidance. Um, uh, it's, it's not direction that we're asking from, uh, uh, from council, but help give them some guidance so that, you know, as they're uh, moving forward with tackling this, uh, 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 th this challenge uh, that they can, you know, take, take your advice about uh, the best ways to, um, uh, to go about that. Uh, so that when they meet in January for the, um, you know, their organizational session, they'll have some good uh, sense for what uh, council's aspirations are for them. And that'll help them then with the, uh, uh, with their own planning, uh, uh, planning efforts. Um, so let me review the agenda that we have today in order to accomplish that. Uh, we'll begin with uh, Stephanie Field, and um, uh, as Mayor mentioned, she'll be the administrative li liaison for the, uh, uh, for the commission, and she'll share a couple of things that have already been taken. Uh, at that point, uh, after, after she's done with that, I'm going to ask council to share um, the outcomes that you would like for the, uh, 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 for the commission. You know, this is kind of your, your opportunity to share the aspirations that you see for the, uh, uh, for the commission to tackle. Um, uh, and then after that, we're going to turn it over to the uh, good folks at, uh, uh, at MML, and they'll share the resources that MML has uh, related to DEI issues. And they also have a couple of case studies from other communities that they're going to uh, um, uh, share so that you'll get a sense for, um, you know, how, how other folks have gone about the, uh, these particular challenges. Uh, and in one of the issues that we're looking, you know, for guidance from you is, you know, which of those things seem to fit best within the uh, uh, Westland context. Uh, again, to give, uh, uh, give the commission some, uh, some direction about it. Uh, then we have a break scheduled. And after the break, we're going to invite uh, questions from, uh, uh, from council as well as from commissioners to ask of the MML. So that as long as you have the experts, you know, on, online here, um, get as much information as you can uh, uh, out of them uh, about the advice that they would offer and, you know, where, what it is that other folks have, uh, uh, have done. Uh, we'll then ask for commissioner feedback uh, uh, on what it is that they think they'd like to, uh, uh, like to accomplish, and then turn it back over to council again um, for, for some prioritization. And at that point, we'll have heard from uh, uh, individual council members, we'll have heard from uh, uh, the MML, and we'll have heard from commission members about um, uh, outcomes that they'd like to see for commission to tackle. And, and the key question is, what seems to be most important, most Westland to help move the city forward uh, with it? Now, we're not looking for any vote in this, uh, not looking for anything other than uh, you to share your thoughts and, um, uh, uh, and advice uh, for the commission. And uh, at that time, you know, once we're through that, we'll wrap it up for, um, uh, with, with public comment. Uh, my role throughout this is that I'll be facilitating that, uh, uh, that dialogue, but I'm going to need your help uh, throughout. We do want to wrap up by lunchtime, and as you heard, that's quite a bit of content to, uh, uh, to tackle with in that uh, time frame. So um, during some of the discussion items, during the uh, uh, question, I may ask you to move things along. I'm going to be kind of specific about um, you know, time constraints so that we can make sure that we're able to accomplish as much as we can, respect one another's uh, uh, ability to share their thoughts and, uh, and the like, and be out of, uh, be out here by, um, uh, by lunchtime. 
Um, the other thing that I'm doing is I'll be capturing some, some of the thoughts along the way. So as you uh, share like a particular outcome or whatever, uh, um, I may ask for a little bit of clarification just to make sure that we're, uh, we're capturing things uh, well. Um, and, and again, I need to emphasize, we, we don't need to agree on anything today. Uh, but what we do want is to share the, um, you know, the outcomes that you'd like for the DEI to, to accomplish so that they have some guidance uh, when, they, uh, when they sit down in, um, uh, in, 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 in January, uh, you know, for that organizational type of, uh, uh, type of meeting. Um, so I'll turn it over to Stephanie in, in a moment. But first, um, uh, for the public, I suppose, I did want to read the, um, uh, the resolution that was passed. And it was, uh, uh, the number is 2020-08-181. Uh, and it's the resolution declaring racism as a public health crisis. Uh, so it's only two pages. I'll get through it in, um, uh, in you know, as quickly as I can. Uh, but whereas race is a social construct with no biological basis, and whereas racism is a social system with multiple dimensions, individual racism is internalized or interpersonal, and systemic racism is institutional or structural, and is a system of structuring opportunity and assigning value based on the social interpretation of how one looks that unfairly disadvantages some individuals and communities, unfairly advantages other individuals and communities and saps the strength of the whole society through waste of human resources. And whereas racism causes persistent racial discrimination in housing, education, employment, and criminal justice, an emerging body of research demonstrates that racism is a social determinant of health. And whereas more than 100 research studies have linked racism to worse health outcomes, and whereas the United Nations declared it a decade from 2015 to 24, focused on the people of African descent for recognition, justice, and development to ensure human rights and fight against structural racism. And whereas the Michigan Health Equity Roadmap states that racial and ethnic minority populations experience poorer health outcomes than the general population for almost every health category and social condition. And whereas in Michigan, the highest excess death rates exist for African-Americans for infant mortality, maternal mortality and pediatric asthma. And whereas the Michigan Coronavirus Task Force on Racial Disparities formed by Executive Order 2020-55 to address the disproportionately impacted communities of color as African-Americans represent 13.6% of Michigan's population, but 40% of deaths from COVID-19. Whereas public health responsibilities to address racism include reshaping our discourse an agenda so that we all actively engage in racial justice work. And whereas there is no epi epidemiological definition of crisis, the health impact of racism clearly rises to the definition of crisis being any situation that is going to lead to an unsustainable and dangerous situation affecting a group community or whole society. Whereas the city has adopted ordinances prohibiting discrimination based in whole or in part on the actual or perceived race, color, religion, national origin, sex, age, height, weight, condition of pregnancy, marital status, physical or mental limitation, source of income, family responsibility, sexual orientation, gender identity or HIV status of another person, that person's relatives or that person's associates, whereas the city has adopted ordinances prohibiting discrimination in housing practices, public accommodations, employment practices and other matters. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the city, of, by the Westland City Council that uh, racism is a public health crisis affecting our ent entire society. The city council directs the mayor to form a commission to implement this resolution within 90 days of the resolution being passed. The commission will conduct an assessment of internal policy and procedures to ensure racial equity is a core element of the organization led by commission in collaboration with other relevant parties communicates results of assessments and determines the appropriate interval for reassessment. The commission is to work to creatively and to create an equity and justice oriented organization with the commission identifying specific activities to increase diversity and to incorporate anti-racism principles across membership, leadership, staffing, and contracting. 
The city council administration and commission shall seek to identify specific activities to increase diversity and to incorporate anti-racism principles across the city, its leadership, staffing and contracting, and shall review internal policy and procedures to ensure racial equity is a core element of the organization. The city council and administration shall incorporate into the organization educational efforts to address and dismantle racism, expand understanding of racism and how racism affects individual and population health and provides, provide tools to assist members to engage actively and authentically with communities of color. The city council and administration shall advocate for relevant policies that improve health in communities of color and supports local state and federal initiatives that advance social justice while also encouraging individual member advocacy to dismantle systemic racism. And finally, the city council and administration shall work to build alliances and partnerships with other organizations that are confronting racism and encourages other local state and national entities to recognize racism as a public health crisis. Okay, so that uh, uh, was the resolution. And again, it's quite aspirational in and of itself. And the um, uh, point of today is to get some feedback from council as well as commissioners about what those aspirations could look like. There are some points in there that are prescriptive about you know, reviewing policy and, um, uh, and the like, but um, in general, there is uh, uh, a little bit of room there for, um, for guidance for what it is that the uh, uh, commission will, will tackle. And so that's what we'll um, uh, uh, look for uh, uh, from, from today's discussion. Um, so to begin that discussion, I'd like to turn it over to Stephanie uh, to share um, uh, uh, a little bit about her role as the, um, you know, she'll be the administrative liaison to the group, but also share a couple of things related to what the city has, um, uh, has already done as it relates to DEI issues. Thank you, Scott, and good morning, everyone. Um, I would like to first share the City of Wesson's statement on diversity, equity, and inclusion. The City of Wesson is committed to and accountable for advancing diversity, equity, and inclusion in all of its form. We embrace individual uniqueness, foster a culture of inclusion that supports both broad and specific diversity initiatives, leverage the educational and institutional benefits of diversity, and engage all individuals to help them thrive. We value inclusion as a core strength and essential element of the public mission. Um, in, in Westland, we have established through our ordinances, the city's non-discrimination policies regarding daily life in our community. We will foster and maintain a safe environment of respect and inclusion for all of our residents, employees, and visitors to our community. We will strive to educate our residents, employees, and visitors to be social justice advocates, creatively providing curricula, programs, environmental that reflect the diversity of our community and elevate cultural awareness. We will ensure fair and inclusive access to our facilities, programs, resources, and services, and ensure that all of our policies and practices are inclusive and equitable. We will advance and build our workforce by assessing hiring practices and performance review procedures to attract, retain, and develop talented employees and staff from diverse backgrounds. The City of Westland is an equal opportunity affirmative action employer and is committed to providing employment opportunities to all qualified applicants without regard to race, religion, age, sex, sexual orientation, gender identity, national origin, disability, or protected veteran status. Um, that being said, um, I just wanted to move forward to um, the, um, the DEI Commission uh, demographic chart that we have um, worked on and are, uh, is on our website. So I'm gonna screen share right now um, that document. Can everyone see my screen? Yes, we can. Great. So this is our um, diversity uh, commission's uh, demographic um, makeup. Uh, and the charts are, are um, cover the gender geographic area of the commission uh, where they live within our city, the ethnicity and the age. Uh, so that you can see this chart, um, we, um, we have put this together and the charts are available on our website um, for each of the uh, commissions. Um, I'm gonna share another chart uh, here right now. Let's see. 
Okay, bear with me. I'm going to bring up another. Um, no, let's see where it's at here. Can you see that or no? Not seeing it. Here it is. Stephanie, you need to show. Uh, yeah, there it is. Sorry. Yep. Yeah. Do you see it now? Yes, we do. Okay. Thank you. Um, so this um, is the overall um, of all boards and commissions. So this is the demographic makeup of all our boards and commissions um, by age, ethnicity, gender, and the ge uh, geography area that the individuals. Uh, represent in our city. Um, so these, this is located on our boards and commission um, website on the main page of the board and commission website. Uh, each board and commission will have their own um, demographic chart. Uh, if you go into the website, you'll see the boards and commissions uh, listed and then you'll click on the um, board and commission that you would like to see and, and that chart will be in there as well. Um, I just wanted to explain my role as administrative liaison. Um, my role as administrative liaison is attending meetings and assisting in preparation of the meetings and agendas and the minutes. Um, I will arrange the locations of meetings, uh, dissemination and communicate information to the commission. I will ensure compliance with the Open Meetings Act, uh, serve as a point of contact between the commission and the city administration, and provide updated bylaws and other commission documents to the mayor's office. Uh, throughout the last couple years, the city has provided employee training sessions to all city employees in the areas of um, unconscious bias, sensitivity, diversity, transgender, and general non-conforming training, and others. Uh, as HR director, I was fortunate enough to participate in the SHRM 2020 Inclusion Virtual Convention in October. This convention covered sessions on equity, DEI strategy, discrimination in the workplace, unconscious bias, workplace culture and communication, just to name a few. Um, I just wanna say I look forward to the first DEI commission meeting, which is scheduled for January 13th at 5.30. And I will now turn it back over to Scott. Thank you, Scott. All right, thank you. So, so now's the point where we'd like to hear from council. Um, uh, you know, you, you all voted to establish the DEI commission. Uh, it was unanimous and um, uh, we, we want to hear from you. I think the commission would like to hear from you. Uh, you know, what, what made you support or sponsor um, uh, the resolution? What problems do you see that you would like for the commission to, to tackle? Um, you know, what hopes is it that you have that the commission will accomplish during their, uh, uh, during their time together? And if there were specific actions that were included in the uh, uh, therefore be it resolved section that you may wish to comment on as well, um, feel free to do that. Uh, so I'll call on you individually. Um, what, I, what I'll ask for you though, is that, that you have a, a three minutes to comment. Again, we don't want to, um, you know, we have constraints as far as time goes. Uh, we, we don't want to debate other council members' opinions uh, um, uh, on it, but we want to give everybody the opportunity to, uh, 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 to share thoughts. Um, so, so please do so um, uh, up to three minutes again. Uh, for it. And um, what I'd like to do is just call on council members individually. Um, uh, and we'll do it in alphabetical order just so uh, uh, everybody has, has the chance. And I'm going to be capturing some of the, uh, some of the thoughts uh, that, that are shared. And then later on in the meeting, we'll, um, uh, we'll go ahead and uh, uh, revisit that just to um, uh, put it within the context of the other sources of, of information that we'll have. Um, so, so I'd like to uh, start with uh, uh, what Council Member uh, uh, Adbell, please. Thanks. Um, I guess from a perspective of what I'd like to see uh, come out of the commission is uh, not only a review of our city policies, procedures, uh, things that that go on within the, the various departments the union contracts, the things that would uh, uh, potentially hold some bias or some hidden bias. Uh, so not only looking at that, but looking at how we can at attract and retain uh, 
quality individuals of all races, uh, ethnicities um, within the city. And, and I know we've struggled uh, with, in particular, in our public safety departments uh, and our, uh, um, you know, our police and fire civil service commission has done everything they can think of uh, to try and attract minority candidates uh, to both departments and have, and have long struggled with trying to, to uh, attract candidates. And I know that Westland's not unique in that situation. That's going on across the state, across the country, actually. Uh, but it, is there something that, that we can do to try and attract quality candidates, particularly in the area of public safety, where it's, uh, you know, that, that we've struggled with for years. So that's pretty much all I have. Thanks. You're still muted, Scott. I hope that's the only time today. I apologize. <laughs> uh, uh, next is uh, um, Council Member uh, Green. I don't believe Councilman Green is on the call today. Okay. Next is yourself, sir, uh, Council President Hart. Thank you. Uh, you know, Councilman Godbout kind of took a lot of uh, what I had to say, which is which is not unusual for him to do to me. Uh, but he usually is uh, well put together, and he knows he does very well to to wrap up kind of what we're all thinking. Um, my goal is exactly what the, the uh, councilman did say, of course, is to take a review at our policies and procedures um, it, holistically in the city and how we do things and find where there's a, a areas for improvement or, or, or be things that we really need to look into and uh, maybe maybe take a closer look at and find out what we need to do to, of course, generate and maintain inclusion. Um, he also brought up public safety, and, and I agree that that is an area that we're struggling with. Um, but I, as he also did allude to, that that's a national issue that we've been told by, by several people in law enforcement and public safety. So we need to do what we can on our level, um, of course, but all we also need to understand that it's a national issue and maybe also understand why it's a national issue. And that might be able to help us understand locally what we might be able to do differently. Um, so I, I think that's an opportunity for the commission to take. Um, and the other thing I like from the commission to do is tell me what I don't know. You know, what am I forgetting to ask? What is it that I'm not aware of? You know, it, it, it's, it's, I look at the commission as, you know, you, you're, you're the balloon that goes up. You're the warning. You're the voice. You're there to kind of communicate to the council and let us know, hey, this is a red flag. This is something we need to look at. Uh, you're the professionals. We, we look at you for your guidance. Um, where we're, we, we deeply treasure your vast experience and uh, we're here to listen to you. Uh, and that's why we put this commission together. And I, we, and I support all of the members that the mayor put on. It's just, it's, it's outstanding. So that's what I have to add right now. Those are the kind of the outcomes I'm looking at. And I think uh, that's kind of what we talked about when we started. So I'll, I'll go ahead and uh, wrap it up, Scott, and uh, we'll see what the next uh, council member has to say. All right, good. And the next one is uh, uh, Councilman uh, Herzberg. I don't think Mr. Herzberg is on either. All right. Then uh, uh, Councilman Lando. Scott, and thanks uh, to you and your team for all the work you put in and uh, the mayor's office and Council President Hart for putting it together. Um, a lot of the same comments that uh, my two colleagues just mentioned, so I won't uh, jump into too much of that. Go down a few things. You know, obviously we're here um, to talk strategically about um, diversity, equity, inclusion, and I agree. I think we have a fantastic set of board members uh, that represent various ethnicities uh, and skill sets across our community. So I'm really looking forward to hearing from each and every one of them. Um, again, hiring and retaining quality employees. Um, you want employees that you know look like the residents of your city um, and represent your city. Uh, so I'd like to see that looked into. Um, Two other things. Uh, I know we do a really good job about, <clears throat> pardon me, do a really good job about, you know, celebrating Black History Month, uh, which is extremely important. We do a lot of things at City Hall. Uh, we have an art gallery where um, the whole month there's, there's African-American art artifacts on the walls. Um, but there's there's more. You know, we have Hispanic, Hispanic Heritage Month that goes on annually. You have Native American Heritage Month that goes on annually. Um, LBGTQ Month is June. So um, maybe, you know, looking into um, 
bringing awareness to those to those things as well. I'm sure there's more. Those are the four that I wrote down. Um, but you know, doing events. Obviously, when we can get back into doing events, um, doing events or um, highlighting you know various individuals in our community uh, that maybe are Native American ascent ascent. Excuse me, um, Hispanics, uh, Asians. You know everything. So. Just a few things I thought of. I'm looking forward again to hearing what everybody has to say. I'm sure we'll come up with more ideas and thoughts as we as we move along. But thank you again for uh, everything you guys have put together with this. All right, thank you, and uh, <coughs> Council Member uh, uh, McDermott. Well, good morning, and thank you for putting this together. Um, I wanted to just start out by you know echoing the sentiments of my colleagues, reviewing our training policies, procedures here in the city of Westland. I would like to see us, and I know that affirmative action has been banned in the state of Michigan, unfortunately, but I would like to see us set a percentage goal that says if the city, when we look at the 2020 census data, when we get that information back, if the city of Westland is 15 or 20% African-American, I would like to see the DEI board work with the city to set hiring goals and to set um, you know long-term goals for the makeup of the city that says if our community is 20% African American or 15% African American or two to three, four percent, you know, Arab American, that we set goals that say our city workforce is going to be really reflexive of the city in terms of the percentage makeup of that race or that ethnicity uh, within the city. Um, I would also like to see us um, review uh, training policies and procedures for LGBTQA hiring practices. Uh, we often know that people who are open to gay, uh, transgender, um, face discrimination in the workplace. I know that, you know, Stephanie's worked really hard to uh, build a, a diverse culture here in the city's workforce and an accepting culture, um, but also something that, you know, I think we need to take a look at is LGBTQA hiring practices in the makeup of our, our community. And then the other thing, there are, to my knowledge from the research I've done, five communities, Detroit, Grand Rapids, Kalamazoo, Lansing, and Muskegon, who have a civilian review or citizen oversight with their police. And, um, you know, having some kind of community oversight program initiative to work with the police department, um, be allowing the, you know, the DEI to partner with the, the PD to have some kind of like citizen review or citizen oversight um, process or authority, um, I think is something that we should take a look at as well. Uh, I certainly understand that these civilian review boards or citizen review boards that work with police departments in communities like, you know, Grand Rapids, Kalamazoo, Muskegon, don't have any legal authority to act if there is a situation of, of bias or, you know, discrimination potentially, but they work with their departments, they work with their police chiefs, they work with the, the members on the force, the personnel to, uh, you know, increase diversity within the police to deal with issues of, you know, potential discrimination or misconduct or injustice. So some kind of citizen oversight uh, piece working with the police department, I think, is something that I would like to see as a part of the DEI board as well. I know that the communities that were aforementioned have those oftentimes as separate boards, but I want to see if there's, you know, any potential to merge those two ideas together with what we have with DEI and a potential citizen oversight piece uh, with law enforcement as well. Thank you. All right, thank you. And uh, uh, council member uh, uh, Rakowski, please. Good morning, everyone. Um, I wanted to thank you, Scott, and the mayor and uh, President Hart for um, making these strategic planning sessions something that could come to fruition. It's something that I've advocated for, and I'm very proud that the very first one is um, with our new board of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, that being said, you know, obviously, I would like to echo everything my colleagues have said, and um, but here are my my more dialed down specifics. Um, I want the commission to look at opportunity and access to information and resources for our minority members of our community and to ensure that that information and access is readily available to them. Um, I want us to look at our policies and make sure that they are inclusive. Um, I would like them to be able to facilitate education, not just for administration and legislative members, but for the community at whole. Um, one and done uh, sensitivity training and things like that, um, an unconditional bias training uh, doesn't create uh, the true learning and growth opportunity because once it's done, 
you know, have a way of making sure that's being implemented and refined to your person. Um, I'd like to see the promotion and training of events to bring awareness to DEI um, in our community. Um, I would like to see more cultural awareness and competency training, team building exercises, um, and just to make sure that we're having an ongoing dialogue. And um, excuse me, and I would like to see that those educational tools that are put in place, like the awareness and competency training are being um, implemented into our core competencies for our manage managers and our director heads. And uh, I think that's it. <laughs> uh, you know, it's, they have quite the task and it's not going to be um, something that can all be implemented uh, spontaneously. But I think that each of the members of our board mm -hmm. brings a very specific um, ability and, um, experience. So I'm looking forward to just learning. Um, so yeah, thank you. Good, good. Um, uh, and Mayor Wild, did you want to comment as well? You, you know, Scott, I, I, I kind of shared more probably in the beginning than you thought I was going to. So, um, but, you know, I, I echo the, the, the sentiments that, that I've heard from our, our city council and, um, um, we're, we're kind of, I mean, for the most part, we're kind of hearing the same thing for, from everybody. And, and I think that, be, you know, I think that's why there was unanimous support on uh, the resolution. So um, I work, I, I look forward to working, uh, you know, hand in hand with the city council, the administration's uh, willing to support this 100% or committed to supporting it 100%. All right, good. Um, so uh, very, very helpful. Again, I took some notes on it. I'll present those a little bit later on, along with feedback from uh, from MML and uh, and commissioners themselves. Um, uh, and, and now we'd like to turn it over to the uh, uh, turn it over to the MML. Uh, they'll present um, uh, again. The basic topics are going to be uh, uh, things that you know, resources that MML has, as well as examples from, from you know, other, uh, other communities. They'll present, and then after that, we'll take a break, let you, you know, uh, uh, think about it and, and stuff like that, but then come back and be able to ask, uh, uh, ask them some, some questions as well. Um, and so, uh, turn it over to them. Let me tell you, uh, from MML, we have uh, uh, Selma Tucker and Kelly Warren. Uh, Selma is the Director of Strategic Communications, and Kelly is the Director of Membership and Affiliate uh, Engagement. Um, uh, I'm going to read their bios to you uh, and then uh, ask them to, uh, to go ahead with their presentation. So Selma is an expert in public policy communication uh, and the MML Director of Strategic Communications, ensuring the League and its members have growing influence on issues and policies that accrue to greater community wealth and higher quality of life. He makes this happen by leading a team of community wealth and higher, or I'm sorry, of, a team of professionals, designers, writers, media experts, event managers, technicians, and creative staff that are deeply integrated with their diverse colleagues and members in service of shared objectives. Um, and it, there's other uh, uh, projects that he may get into, but I'd like to highlight for you that um, since 2019, uh, he served on the Leadership Committee for Fair and Equal Michigan, a citizen-led initiative to expand the state's Elliot Larson Civil Rights Act to include sexual orientation, gender identity, and gender expression. He has a deep personal and professional commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion, which he exercises on the League's DEI committee, charged with ensuring the organization uh, uh, constitutes to realize its vision of an open, exclusive, and equitable workplace culture that can serve as an effective facilitator for change for communities. Uh, Selma holds a bachelor's degree in public administration with concentration in economic development and a second major in political science and a master's in public administration specializing in public management, both from Grand Valley State University. So you can hear his role in, um, uh, in DEI issues at the league is very similar to some of the objectives that you had uh, uh, identified that you'd like to see for, um, uh, for council. So look forward to hearing from him. And in addition, Kelly Warren is the director of membership and affiliate engagement. 
uh, and she dedicates a significant portion of her time to strategically engage and connect members to the league's innovative programs and services. Her department is responsible for the ongoing operations, programs and services for the league's affiliate organizations, including planning and development of new programs and services, communications and uh, outreach strategies. These affiliate organizations include Michigan Association of Mayors, the Michigan Black Caucus of Local Elected Officials, and the Michigan Women in Municipal Government. Uh, the department also provides support for the Michigan Association of Municipal Attorneys, the Michigan Municipal Executives, and administers the Elected Officials Academy. So some of you may have gone to uh, uh, some of the trainings that Kelly and others have put on for it. Um, uh, Kelly is also the catalyst behind the league's diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts, which have expanded significantly in recent years. She's a member of the league's newly formed internal DEI committee, which is tasked with engaging the league board of trustees to shape organizational priorities, culture, and membership programming. Her leadership supports the league's increasingly sophisticated understanding and participation in DEI best practices. Um, she has over 20 years of experience planning events, managing projects, problem solving, and building a relationship with members. Prior to joining the league, Kelly worked at Eastern Michigan University. So you can tell we've got a, a couple of great uh, folks to share their perspective. And um, uh, Selma, Kelly, I'll, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Scott, thank you so much. And thank you for that wonderful introduction. Mayor Wild, Council President Hart, Council members and commissioners, we thank you for allowing us to be with you today on this Saturday and to assist you in this very important endeavor. So I am going to go ahead and share my screen and we will get started. All right, can you all see that? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you so much. So I wanna start by sharing that I have been with the league and supporting communities for I just told Selma yesterday it was 23 years, but actually in January, it'll be 24 years. Um, and DEI has been part of my scope since around 2014. Um, we're honored to be here with you today. We wanna to share resources, examples, and leave you with some lessons learned from our observations, studying communities that have been intentional about addressing race, diversity, and equity. I do wanna highlight that neither Selma nor I are DEI experts but we are experts in helping you, helping get answers to your questions and impairing you with the people and resources to help you on your journey. Uh, we spoke with DEI experts in the formation of today's presentation, and we would encourage you to leverage their expertise as you move forward. Our hope is that the resources, examples, and lessons we share will help Westland and the DEI Commission accelerate their work by adapting practices from other communities for your specific needs and goals. This presentation is about going beyond a statement. We talk about what we've done before and after our statement, and we will give you some insight on our plans going forward. And we also, we wanna not acknowledge your commitment to going beyond a statement. We appreciate that. So at the league, we see diversity, equity, and inclusion as a mindset first and a milestone second. There's no end point. It's a way of thinking and decision-making that gets folded into all of your processes, programming and engagement activities. And although we have a culture of diversity, equity and inclusion at the league, we recognize the need to constantly work to improve that culture. The League has worked on DEI efforts for many years and created and supported many initiatives aimed at supporting DEI. Our efforts started becoming much more intentional in 2014 with Michigan Black Caucus of Local Elected Officials. NBC Leo, as we call them, they are an affiliate organization of the League. And we, they approached us after several high profile cases of African-American men and women being killed at the hands of police. They wanted to do something about it. They wanted to bring together community members and the law enforcement community to have the tough discussions about what was happening nationally. 
and the league committed resources to helping them do that. And they created their race and law enforcement forums, which they took around the state. They went from Saginaw to Holland um, to Southfield. And we brought in speakers from the National League of Cities Race, Equity, and Leadership Department. And I want to pause here and highlight that National League of Cities is one of the resources that you guys could definitely or should definitely look into. I'm not sure if Westland is a member right now of NLC, but even if you are not, there's a ton of resources on the city website, nlc.org. Uh, there's case studies, reports, toolkits, and that is definitely um, a spot where you will want to um, take advantage of. We began to look at our convention and conferences and the sessions that we offered, and we became more deliberate in the types of speakers that we were bringing in. We wanted to make sure that our keynote speakers actually were a reflection of our audience as well. And we brought in speakers from Race Forward and from the WK Kellogg Foundation, Truth, Racial Healing and Transformation Program. That's another website that you'll want to check out for additional resources. In 2018, we started our 1650 project. And this is based on the fact that women make up 50% of the population in the state, but they are only 16% of municipal managers. And so we wanted to move the needle on that. And we actually have through our women's municipal leadership program. We started it in 2018 and we have had 84 graduates and eight of them have gone on to lead Michigan communities. We then begin to work with the Michigan Department of Civil Rights and helped create a cultural competency program. It was a pilot program that we did in the Southwest part of the state. Um, five communities went through it. It was six months long and we hope to actually take that program around the state. Michigan hired their first racial equity officer in 2018 as well. And he created the Council for Local Government and Education on Equity and Inclusion. I have a seat on that council and the league president and vice president are invited to participate on the council as well. Mayor Wild was not aware of that, but I will be sending him information about it next week. Um, and they have a goal of cross-sharing on DEI initiatives. And so communities don't have to recreate the will. Through our Elected Officials Academy, Advanced Weekender sessions, we have started to include sessions on fostering inclusive community environments and focusing on the economic side of why it is important to have an inclusive community. In the summer of 2018 at the Board of Trustees annual retreat, there was a conversation that started, we had a facilitator in and he mentioned the word diversity. And one of the board members said, well, diversity might not mean the same thing to me that it means to you. And he said, well, let's open up that conversation. What does it mean? And so a robust discussion started and they talked about it for the next day and a half during the retreat. And out of that was born the League Board of Trustees Standards of Excellence, which became their, there's 13 guiding principles that they follow. And the 12th one is to model and teach diversity and inclusive behavior. So at that time, it became a priority for our board. We began to have sessions during our board of trustees meetings on topics of diversity, equity, and inclusion. We did an internal review of our pay system to make it more equitable. And where we saw inconsistencies, we did make adjustments. We began to work closely with our Urban Core Mayors group. Um, and this group represents the majority of the African-American population in the state. Uh, they work on policies, best practices, and strategies. Our foundation began fundraising for transformative projects, one of which is the recreation complex in the city of Hamtramck. They have one of the last remaining Negro League baseball stadiums, and um, we have helped to raise money for that project. We have dedicated issues of our magazine to the topic. Um, the most recent one was November, December, but our January, February, 2021 magazine will focus on racial um, equity. And over the years, we've had a number of different articles, radio shows and, and podcasts on the topic. 
So in 2020, after the death of George Floyd, things really accelerate, accelerated. Um, I, I want to say there were 15 or 16 of us that got together right after that happened. And we got on a Zoom um, and just wanted to talk about how we were feeling on a personal level. And just like I cried when I saw the video, I cried on the Zoom call with my colleagues. And that's not me. I don't cry at work. But that's just how intense it was. And I'm, I'm the mom of a 30-year-old Black male. Um, and I get emotional even thinking about it now. So we won't relive that moment. But we, we had a great conversation. And it went from personal, talking about how we felt personally about it, to what should we be doing as an organization? Should we be doing anything? And so we ended up splitting off into three different areas of focus, um, one being board engagement and then internal programming and member programming. So we reached out to our president and vice president. Mayor Wild was actually our vice president at the time. And as you all know, he's our president now. I think you all are aware of that. Um, and they worked with he and the current president. She is now mayor of Saginaw, um, Brenda Moore. They worked quickly with the Board of Trustees and issued a statement. Um, then the Michigan Black Caucus Board contacted us. They wanted to issue a statement and we helped to disseminate that statewide. And then we shared. So all of the information I just shared with you on what the league has been doing, we made sure that we shared that information with the board um, at their summer retreat. And then going forward, the board, we will continue to have training sessions with the board, board of trustees on DE&I. Internal programming, we had an, an initial DEI training for all staff. It was on the basics of diversity, equity, and inclusion, and some implicit bias. We did an organizational assessment and training for directors, and then we sent a survey out to all of our staff. We had two webinars, one on generations in the workplace and one on removing biases and microaggressions in the workplace. And we are working with two consultants and are scheduled um, to have training through the end of 2021. Now that doesn't mean we stop there, we're just contracted with two people and then we'll um, figure out where we go from there. With member programming, we had a webinar on the future of public safety, reimagining how we invest. Um, we talked, to, we had a webinar on exploring the barriers to equity, understanding the local impacts of the criminal justice system. And then as part of our convention, we had um, an introduction to DEI. We actually had an encore presentation of the future of public safety because it was really popular. And then the Michigan Black Caucus, they typically host a session during our convention and conference. They actually um, showed a film, a 60 minute film called Walking While Black. And we were able to bring in the director of the film to do a Q&A session after the film. And I would recommend that everyone sees it. It's very powerful, very enlightening. Um, the website is loveistheanswermovement.com. And the author has also written a book, which I'm gonna turn this over to Selma, if he can jump in and tell us a little bit about what we're going to do um, with that book. Sure, thanks Kelly. Um, so the Love is the Answer book is a companion piece to, uh, to the documentary and the movie that, uh, that uh, we watched at convention, uh, Walking Well Black. And the, it, it's a community read that we have sent or are sending actually to our league staff, our, uh, our league board of trustees, um, the board of directors for our foundation, as well as the boards for our uh, risk and insurance, uh, and insurance organizations. And the goal here is to engage our community, our, uh, our internal community and the folks who govern us in a conversation about uh, how, to, how to sort of organize and assess uh, what, we, uh, what we felt. Um, as, as Kelly mentioned, when we watched that movie, um, it, it provoked a whole, an, an, really an avalanche of, of emotions and ideas um, and that is pretty typical with this work that you, uh, that something sparks you and it hits you uh, in a really visceral way. Um, and, and that can be on, on a whole spectrum of feelings. Um, and the, the question for us as leaders is how do we take that energy? How do we take that response and turn it into, uh, and turn it into momentum? 
So that book is designed to help us understand how to organize these feelings and gives us some tools and resources uh, for, for, uh, for encouraging the things that unite us as opposed to um, sort of inflaming the things that divide us. Um, so it, it's designed to encourage empathy. It's designed to uh, operationalize what, uh, it's designed to operationalize unity. And, uh, and so that, that community read we think is gonna be really important. And, and then we'll check in after that. You'll see that this is a pretty iterative process and we'll talk about how other communities have followed suit in similar fashion. Thank you, Selma. And then we launched a diversity, equity, and inclusion resource page on our website. And here's a snapshot or screenshot of the home screen. So listen, engaged, engage, act. That's based on the statement that was issued by our board. And actually the statement started out by saying, listen, and then act. And we felt that we needed to add the engagement piece in order to get people to act. Um, on the site, <clears throat> excuse me, you will find a link to any future webinars, which I can say we don't have any scheduled right now, but we will be doing that after the first of the year. But you can also find a link to the webinars that have already taken place. So you can watch those, you can look at the PowerPoints. We have sample um, documents out there from some of our members, sample articles, and then we also have links to um, the Michigan Department of Civil Rights. They have a racial equity pledge and a racial equity toolkit. The Michigan Black Caucus has resources on there and they are in the process of completing a toolkit that will be posted there, I hope within the next couple of weeks. Um, the Government Alliance on Race and Equity has a couple of toolkits that are posted out there. And then we also have a link to the National League of Cities but we only highlighted a couple of toolkits. And as I mentioned earlier, they have a ton of information on their website. So you'll wanna go directly to their website as well. And then what's next for us and going forward, well, I talked a little bit how we started out. There were 16 of us. Um, one of our consultants recommended that we get that group down to about eight members and turn that into our internal DEI committee. And so we have done that. Selma and I are two of the the eight on that newly formed committee, we will be devising a plan um, that is sustainable and really talking about what DEI means for us. And then we'll be adopting our own set of um, success metrics. And then you all are early adopters of a professional development piece for members. So what we're sharing with you today is the start of filling out a curriculum around understanding and enacting DEI initiatives at the local level. Selma. Thank you, Kelly. And uh, Kelly will, Kelly and I will, uh, will go back and forth a little bit on this next part um, because we uh, we both have uh, we were both so honored to uh, to be asked to address uh, this commission and the city council, uh, as well as uh, as well as the residents and the public who are who are under the sound of our voice today, and uh, we were we we said you know we think what would be most helpful when we after we read that resolution, which was really quite powerful, um, and is uh, I think was described as aspirational earlier, um, and and I and I do think. That uh, being, you should be commended for uh, for your aspirational statements, um, uh, particularly dealing with race. Um, and we said, what is the best way that we can support you uh, in that journey? Because we want to be a partner for you. And we said, uh, why don't we look around at other communities in the state that have um, that have been intentional about their um, about their anti racism or uh, their anti racism or managing um, uh, racist outcomes in their communities. Um, and we said we also wanted to sort of harvest what we thought were uh, some some good examples, uh, not because we think that those are things that you should follow verbatim, uh, but examples that you can uh, observe and say, you know what, that's a that's a good idea. I think this is something that we can use for Westland and we can adapt it um, because, as you heard earlier, the commission is charged with uh, providing recommendations to the council. So. Uh, any exploration that you can do is going to help you in the recommendations that you eventually put forward. So uh, we wanted to we wanted to provide some information to you today that could accelerate that work um, and and can and make you move a little bit faster uh, down down the road of, of coming up with those recommendations. 
So this, uh, this slide deals with communities that have declared racism a public health crisis. You see uh, there are several on here and, and this list is growing. Uh, it's not a fixed list. Um, and this list is growing. Uh, East Lansing just, uh, just a few weeks ago added to this list. Um, and, uh, and, and we noticed that after our research, we were putting this together and we said, oh, we got a new one. Um, and we suspect that additional uh, communities will be added as time goes on. Uh, and you are, uh, you're a part of a cohort, uh, actually. Uh, USA Today recently came out and noted that there are 145 municipalities across the country that have declared racism a public health crisis, similar to you. Um, the list that we found here in Michigan, um, we know is not exhaustive, uh, especially if we start talking about townships, uh, we expect that number would grow. Um, and that's specific to communities that have dealt with this issue through a public health lens. Um, uh, the, there are two communities that we're gonna focus on. Um, uh, so this is a whole list of communities that have focused on uh, racism uh, through lens of public health. Uh, but there, there are two communities that we uh, are going to focus on today that have uh, that have been working on this uh, sort of pre-COVID, and uh, we think that there's a lot that you can learn from them. Um, and there's just more than one way to deal with this issue, and everyone is going to choose a path that is uh, individual and that works for them. So uh, those two communities are Grand Rapids and Huntington Woods, and we'll spend a lot of time talking about them. But uh, before we before we get to that. Um, we wanted to let you know that uh, you are also, your, uh, your community is really part of a three-layer cake that is, um, that has, that's uniform in its approach to, uh, to uh, tackling racism through a public health lens. Uh, what do I mean when I say that? Um, uh, your county, uh, Wayne County, uh, declared racism a public health uh, issue in Ju July 2nd of 2020. Um, you, your local community, uh, declared racism a public health issue. You did that on August 3rd of this year. And in the state of Michigan, uh, Governor Gretchen Whitmer declared racism a public health crisis on August 5th, 2020. So uh, there is uniformity um, with your community uh, at your county, local, and state level. The two communities, um, the two communities we're going to talk about uh, today uh, and spend a little bit of time on are Huntington Woods and the city of Grand Rapids. And while these two communities have not declared racism a public health crisis, they do have a history. Um, uh, one has a very long history and the other is more recent on advancing equity, diversity and inclusion um, that we really think are applicable to the work you all are pursuing. Um, and, and, it, and it's important to note that while these communities uh, didn't, uh, while these communities work, uh, it has been accelerated since the COVID-19 pandemic, um, and your community is a part of 145 other communities um, around the country and, and, and a growing list that, uh, that, that COVID really, uh, really demonstrated just the, the severity of racism's impact on our society. Um, and we all know that racism did not start with COVID. Uh, racism, uh, COVID helped us reveal uh, the impact of, of, of racism on our, on our community. So um, it's just important to note that distinction um, but uh, I think most of these communities are rowing in the same direction. You all want to deal with the same issues. Um, so let's start with the timeline of Huntington Woods. Uh, in 2011, they uh, created a human rights ordinance. And, um, and, in, in, and in 2017, they had a welcoming cities resolution. Uh, you'll see that echoed in uh, the city of Westland and uh, the city of Grand Rapids. Uh, June 2019, they amended their human rights ordinance to uh, 2019. They amended their human rights ordinance to include a prohibition on conversion therapy. Um, in, in June 2nd, 2020, after George Floyd's killing and others, uh, the city issued a statement condemning acts of racial injustice and also called for a commitment for justice, fairness, and peace for all. And in the summer of this year, uh, they created an anti-racism. They created an anti-racism plan. And just recently in November, they took another step by issuing a request for proposals uh, to add DEI uh, constructs to weave it into their master plan, uh, which is, uh, and you'll know, uh, you'll know here that there's a similar progression uh, that you'll see in the city of Grand Rapids. Uh, and you'll, you, you may decide to take a similar approach where um, there's a statement that's made. Um, there's maybe some, uh, maybe some public act in this case, it's an ordinance. Um, and then eventually, as communities go further, they start to weave in uh, DEI and anti-racism principles 
uh, into their daily operations. Um, these things become a lens by which, uh, by which you look through to make decisions. Um, there's, there's not necessarily a section in that strategic plan um, that delves into DEI and anti-racism. We wanna see that happen in every element of the work. So you start to see that and that's what happened here with Huntington Woods. So if we can go on, there's a couple of things I wanna note for you uh, with respect to Huntington Woods. Um, and uh, in, in uh, one of the community highlights is uh, when they went to, um, they had a, there was a Zoom hack uh, with pretty uncanny timing. Not too dissimilar from the conversation we're having today, Huntington Woods, uh, when they went to adopt, uh, when they went to adopt their anti-racism plan, uh, they actually had, they were Zoom hacked. And they weren't just Zoom hacked, uh, they were Zoom hacked and presented with a series of really disturbing images, uh, racist images um, and uh, stuff that uh, we, don't, we don't need to uh, go into today, uh, but uh, it was, it really set them back um, and, and it shocked them the kind of pushback that they received uh, they're not certain if that uh, if that Zoom hack uh, was intentional because of that uh, because of that particular meeting, but um, it, it it is it did sort of illustrate um, the the sort of uh, two steps forward, one step back, or even sometimes two steps forward, three steps back uh, that can happen when you're trying to make progress on this issue. Um, and uh, they uh, the other thing we'll note is that they did incorporate an implicit bias training for staff. And they uh, were actually announcing that implicit bias training when they were communicating with the residents. Um, and uh, when they were communicating with the residents about the activities that they were doing, I think that one of the council members earlier today talked about the importance of promoting this work. Uh, when they were doing that, they, um, they got an idea from, uh, from one of their residents where they said, oh, the resident said, if you're, if you're instituting an implicit bias training for staff, how about one for residents too? Um, and they, they took that they took that idea and, and they ran with it. And in January 2021, we thought this was really interesting. Uh, their community will embark on a community wide book club. And that book club is, uh, is, is designed for all ages in the community. And it is designed to, uh, to, to pair, um, I, I think each they have, they have different segments and they pair their, um, they pair their a, a chapter of a book, uh, the book specifically is Ibram X. Kendi's How to Be an Anti-Racist. Um, and they pair a chapter of his book with a movie and, uh, and the community goes through month by month um, and they, they, they read the chapter in the book and they watch a movie. Um, and so they are, they're collectively um, gaining an increasingly sophisticated understanding of how racism works uh, broadly and how it might be working in their own community. So. Um, they're doing some, um, some, some developments of their own. And they're walking that path together. Uh, in Grand Rapids, uh, their timeline is much longer. So uh, it, um, formally, in 1953, they created their Human Relations uh, Study Committee. Uh, the committee was created to study the need for and outline a possible program for a permanent Human Relations Commission. Uh, the study committee submitted a report with recommendations to create the commission. And in 1955, that commission came to pass by appointing a 15 member human relations commission. Uh, the goal there was to foster mutual understanding and respect among all racial groups, um, religions and, national, and, and national, nationalities that existed in the city. Um, they also wanted to discourage and prevent discriminatory practices among any, any of those groups um, or any of its members. Uh, they also were looking at addressing fair housing, redlining, uh, employment discrimination, and segregation. In 1968, they created a community, a community relations commission. So they changed their name, and that body still exists to this day. And it has, uh, it has an advisory, operational, and quasi-judicial role in, in the city of Grand Rapids. And uh, just, to, just to sort of drill in on that a little bit, um, that, that body is charged with investigating complaints of discrimination and related concerns. Um, and they perform that, they perform that duty for, uh, for, its own, for its own practices, for the body itself and for city staff. Um, they research and make recommendations on discrimination and remedies for, uh, for, that, for that issue. They provide educational and progr programmatic initiatives and activities. Um, and that quasi-judicial role of conducting hearings, making decisions, um, and ensuring compliance 
with, uh, with policies that the commission set. Um, and, and in many cases, those policies were recommended by the, uh, uh, those, rec those, those policies were recommended by the, by the uh, Community Relations Commission itself. Uh, and some of those policies included a, an equal business opportunity policy, uh, an investment policy, and a tax abatement policy. So they're looking at those policies to make sure that uh, that those are um, that those are that those are carried out in the manner that uh, that the commission wanted. So the commission said we want this to happen, and um, and that community relations commission is uh, is sort of serving as a um, as a watchdog and a partner in ensuring that those policies are executed uh, faithfully. In uh, we'll fast forward quite a bit to 1991 where they, uh, the city adopted a workforce diversity policy. Um, and they did, a lot of, they did a lot of things in the 90s. Um, that, workforce that workforce diversity policy was one of them. They also created a city, school board, and community uh, uh, leaders body called the Office of Children, Youth, and Families, uh, which serves as a liaison between school districts and municipal governments to ensure policies and programs better prepare young people for college, work, and life. So they're sort of going uh, further down in the development uh, and making sure that our young people um, uh, are getting the opportunities they need to uh, realize their gift uh, as they as they go as they grow up and become uh, adult citizens contributing to their community. Uh, they also created a civic engagement and leadership program called the Mayor's Youth Council uh, that enabled young people to give voice uh, to issues of concern to elected officials and community leaders. In the 2000s, uh, they created what was called what they're calling what they call excuse me the people the people of color collaborative um and they engaged in public hearings on alleged uh, abuse by by safety um and police um they uh they adopted an opposition uh to english only laws uh, they also created a diversity film series that they engaged their community on um they 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 formed a civilian police academy and they also instituted a banned box uh, ban the box policy, um, which, uh, if, if you're not aware, uh, ban the box is a uh, is 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 a is a is a term that is used to uh, remove uh, the question of, of your your criminal history uh, before your uh, before you're considered for employment. Um, in 2014, uh, the city manager created a 12 point plan uh, to improve police and community relations. Um, and in that, and in that time, they also issued, they also pursued a review of all human re resources and diversity and inclusion policies. Um, the police uh, instituted body cameras. Um, uh, they instituted body cameras uh, universally across police personnel, and they also instituted implicit bias training for all police officers. In 2016, in uh, Mayor Bliss's inaugural address, uh, she stressed. Uh, she stressed equity as a top priority, racial equity specifically. In 2017, uh, they created a racial equity peer initiative, and they partnered with uh, the Government Alliance on Race and Equity to help institute that. In 2018, they created a they created a revised racial equity plan, um, and they also went on to conduct a biannual employee survey focused on racial equity. They instituted racial equity training for all staff and community partners. Um, all departments must submit budgets uh, with a memo on racial equity impacts. There's a citizen survey on community and police relations. Um, they, they, they study and they collect workforce demographics to ensure that they're, um, to ensure that city staff reflect community demographics. Uh, they also, in, they're also looking at um, uh, instituting possible premium pay for staff who are bilingual. So they're, um, so they're looking at that skill set and saying, uh, this is something that we want, and and we think that it it is it, it's a, it's something that we value, and that should be reflected in someone's compensation. Um, they offer programs in English and Spanish. They uh, they also went on to review and evaluate job descriptions to identify racial equity as a core competency. So they want that to be in, in, uh, enveloped into those uh, into those job descriptions. In 2019, uh, they passed their human rights ordinance, and I'll note. Um, uh, in 2019, the city of Grand Rapids passed a human rights ordinance. Uh, Huntington Woods did that in 2011. Um, so you'll see in, in both of these communities, uh, they're, they're not linear. They don't always go in the same, they don't always take the same steps sequentially, um, but uh, there are some overlaps that happen. Um, and which step you take really depends on what your community needs. 
So uh, that human rights ordinance, uh, that human rights ordinance was passed. And uh, the human rights ordinance uh, really created an investigative team as well to investigate allegations uh, that are brought forward of biased crime reports. And if a violation is found to have occurred, the city attorney's office will issue violation notices. And in 2019, they, uh, they minted their, uh, their new strategic plan um, that enveloped racial equity uh, and equity uh, more broadly as a, uh, as a piece of every single one of their objectives. So um, that, that strategic plan, uh, if you read it, uh, you'll see um, that racial, that equity comes up in each of their goals. And so they're, they're sort of folding it into their day-to-day -day work. Um, September 12th through the 20th, uh, Mayor Bliss declared welcoming week. Um, that would probably sound familiar to you, that comes up several times. Uh, through Welcome Week, organizations and communities bring together immigrants, refugees, and longtime residents to build strong connections and affirm the importance of a welcoming and inclusive place um, in, in achieving uh, collective prosperity. And then a couple of highlights for the city of Grand Rapids. In their strategic plan, equity is everywhere. Um, it's, it's not an end goal. It is, it's baked into the cake, if you will. Um, and uh, it's like salt when you bake a cake, you can't, you can't take it out. Um, and they are, uh, they look at it through, 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 uh, through all the decisions that they make, um, that, that equity goal, that equity lens is there. Um, they also did something that was really interesting um, with their racial equity plan here, with their racial equity here plan, where they, they did a deep dive into documenting their history that has served, and, and that has been a really interesting document. It served as a, um, as a, as a living document that chronicles their activities um, over, over, over generations. Um, it chronicles the problems and the issues that the community has dealt with. Um, and, and, it, and it talks about the solutions that were, uh, that were implemented. Um, and one of the things that I was struck when I, uh, when I read through this was that it didn't just talk about um, you know, here was the problem, here was the solution. It also talked about the mood, it talked about the tenor. Um, and and that is an, that's an incredibly important part of, of thinking about uh, where we're making progress on racial equity, um, is that the, the way that people feel about their community, do they have a sense of trust and belonging in their community? Um, and and that, that mood and that tenor is a good measurement of that. Um, and so that, that living document, they're always adding to it, um, that living document helps them to see uh, where they've made progress, both, uh, both on metrics that they can measure and on metrics that they can feel. So um, I do want to pass it over to Kelly, um, and she's got a couple of things she wants to share with you about documenting history. Thank you, Selma. I feel it's important for every community to have a timeline like Selma just laid out with Grand Rapids and Huntington Woods. If you can have a timeline of what your community's history with race um, and no, so I like to bring up the fact of sundown towns because we, we put that out there with our members sometimes and ask, was your community a sundown town? And oftentimes um, communities don't know or they don't know what it is. And for those of you that are not aware, there are certain areas where certain populations weren't um, welcome to stay after sundown, mostly African-Americans. And people are often surprised um, when we say that there were hundreds of sundown towns in Michigan uh, or in the Northern states even. And there's a whole book on it to, for those of you um, who may not be familiar. I actually have it right here, Sundown Towns. Oh, you probably can't see that <laughs> um, by James Lowen. But it's just important to, to know your history and to document your history. I also wanna share um, Sheriff Clayton from Washtenaw County he talks about the county is, I believe, 198 years old. Um, and it's important to learn from that. With a community being 198 years old, you're going to have institutional learning and history that you can't undo, but you can build upon. Um, he says, leaders may change, but the institutional history remains. You must know the history and know if you are not deliberate and intentional all the time about changing the culture, you run the risk of it going back to the way it is. So we can't change the past, but we can learn from it and change the future. Right. 
So we, uh, we want to leave you uh, with some lessons that we think are applicable for your next step. And Kelly and I are going to tag team this section. And uh, I'm, I'm going to start. And uh, the, the first one is to expect and prepare for pushback. Uh, it really is part of the process. Uh, you guys, this is an incredibly difficult subject. Um, and uh, it, it's, it's, it, I, I think it's, it's the Mount Everest of our time. Um, you should expect pushback and, and potentially praise. Um, and as public servants and leaders, regardless, how you respond to that pushback and that praise really should be the same. Uh, communicating about race is often a high voltage situation um, and you should take care and remember uh, best practices of public communication on tough issues. Empathy, accountability, and reform in that order. Set expectations for speed and pace of change or a response if you don't know the answer. Know that when you receive pushback, that is that it is an opportunity to listen and to understand. Try your best not to personalize what you're hearing. Your job as a public servant is to listen with empathy, be accountable for your actions, and change as necessary when you deviate from the commitments you have made. Those commitments are stated in your resolution declaring racism a public health crisis, and that should be your North Star when you're thinking about solutions and recommendations uh, and, 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 explaining the, and explaining the efficacy of of, and the reason behind, uh, behind the actions of your team. Leadership at the highest levels is essential. In the case of Grand Rapids and Huntington Woods, mayors, council members, city managers are essential to change. Whether they're pushed to make changes because of community outcry or they come to it organically, you have to have commitment and buy-in at the highest levels sustained over time. And got to create a feedback loop. Um, communication is a two-way street and maintaining an openness uh, to what you hear is imperative. Active listening is key. This subject can feel so charged and people quickly get defensive. Examining that defensiveness and working to diffuse it is necessary and an important part of the work. Um, and you have to do that in order to hear the things that you might be closed off to. Um, consider the example from Huntington Woods, where they sent out that email blast about their anti-racism initiatives, um, and they heard they heard from their community, and they got uh, they got at least one good idea to offer uh, similar implicit bias training and resources to residents, um, and not just staff. Um, there is uh, there's another example. Um, Kelly, did you want to take this example about Washtenaw County? Oh, on the feedback loop. Sorry about that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yes. Um, again, and so we have referenced Washtenaw County several times, so that might be another um, website that you want to check out and check out their racial equity plan. But early in the Black Lives Matter movement, um, their communications director went to the sheriff and said, hey, I, I, let's have a meeting. And the sheriff said, let's have it. And they both agree that it turned out to be a great discussion. And they found that they wanted many of the same things that Black Lives Matters wanted for the community as well. And so um, the sheriff suggests that you lean into those conversations um, instead of avoiding them. And is the next one mine, Selma? DEI is a mindset, I believe so. Right. <laughs> DEI is a mindset first and milestone second. Um, incorporated in everything that you do. It helps to ensure you're including voices that are easy to leave out um, because the systems on their own create isolation, disenfranchisement, and disparate outcomes. Example, COVID. Um, in the case of Huntington Woods and Grand Rapids, even though their timelines for formal initiatives in this space are very different, they both have an integrated approach to making progress, which helps evolve as their needs change. Injustice is fluid and can appear amorphous. So thinking of it like a mindset helps to ensure your efforts are sustainable. And initiatives need teeth. Uh, and one of the things we noted is that in Grand Rapids, uh, their human relations commission turned community relations board gained formal authority to investigate complaints of discrimination 
ensuring there was a set process to fact find and achieve a resolution. The commission gained, uh, went on to gain uh, quasi-judicial authority to conduct hearings and make decisions on compliance uh, with, with, uh, with city commission policies, um, equal business opportunity policies, their investment policies, and that tax agreement policy. Um, all those policies, uh, the larger commission put into place and wanted to ensure were truly enforced. Uh, without a formal body and process to investigate issues of discrimination, anyone, and that, that really does mean anyone, can fall victim to specious arguments, um, which will eventually erode trust in the institutions that govern those residents. And know your history. Grand Rapids Racial Equity Higher Plan is a living document that chronicles their history with race. It helps them understand where they've been so they can measure their progress and chart an informed course for the future. And, and finally, uh, and, I, and I say this a lot uh, with my team and um, when I'm, when I'm working, uh, emulation is the highest form of flattery. You, you do not have to reinvent the wheel. Um, lessons can be learned from neighbors near and far. Uh, the DEI Commission has a charge, your DEI Commission has a charge to ensure racial equity is a core element of the city of Westland and provide recommendations to make that happen. Um, those recommendations, uh, you're going to tailor those for your community um, and your community specific needs um, and your community's resources. But you don't have, you really don't have to start from whole cloth. Um, learning from those communities like Huntington Woods and Grand Rapids and even others outside the state uh, will accelerate your work, will accelerate your ability to implement your recommendations and your effectiveness. Um, a few communities uh, that, that we wanted to know uh, that we thought you should check out that are outside of the state are uh, our neighbors in the Midwest, Milwaukee, uh, Austin, down, uh, Austin, Texas in the South, and on the West Coast, Seattle. Um, they've all uh, they've all instituted some innovative, creative, and thoughtful programming um, that may prove useful as you uh, as you explore recommendations for for West. And the last slide. If you have questions for uh, either Kelly or I, uh, you, our contact information is there. You can reach out to us at any time. We are. Uh, we are uh, your league, and uh, we're here to be of service to you. Um, and I know that I've really enjoyed uh, exploring this. I love the opportunity to be able to uh, exercise uh, exercise a real personal passion of mine uh, professionally. Um, and, and, it, and it really is an honor to be able to uh, be able to serve you. Uh, Selma, Kelly, thank you again. Um, that was a lot of information, and I'm sure that folks have a, a, have some questions. Um, uh, for you. So we'd like to uh, spend some time, uh, you know, you've got the experts in uh, online right now of uh, Selman Kelly. So um, I want to open it up to members of uh, council to ask some questions uh, of them, members of commission as well uh, to do so. We'll spend like 15, 20 minutes or so on this uh, uh, exercise. And I'll ask you just to, you know, use your hand, hand up feature so that I know whom to uh, uh, call on and hopefully we'll be able to get through, uh, uh, get through everybody that way. Okay. Um, so who'd like to uh, uh, ask some questions for MML? Uh, Councilman McDermott does have his hand up uh, there, Scott, so. Okay, uh, uh, please go ahead. Well, thank you. And thank you to Selma and Kelly for uh, your presentation. Very informative. I learned quite a bit, took uh, some copious notes on that. So I really appreciate it. Um, my first question is for communities that have implemented DEI to specifically look at like hiring practices um, within a municipality. Have any of those communities adopted any kind of like affirmative action quota type system where if you have a community makeup that's 20% African-American or Hispanic or South Asian or you know, any ethnic or racial makeup, have those communities adopted um, you know, hiring initiatives that says we're going to hire 20% of individuals that look like our community? I'll um, answer that question because I'm not sure. However, um, the inquiry service at the league falls in my department. And so that's something that I can take back to our inquiry group and they can look into that. Um, off the top of my head, if there was a community that did it, I would 
guess, but I'm not sure, um, the city of Jackson, um, just because they've been a little more progressive in that area. So I can find out for sure and I can have our inquiry um, team get back with you and make a note. I really appreciate that. I have a few more questions, but I'm gonna let my colleagues and some of the people on the DEI board go. Um, and then I'll circle back if we have time to do any additional questions. Thank you. Okay, questions from others? Uh, I have uh, Commissioner Sedman has her uh, hand up there, Scott. Okay, please go. Commissioner Sedman, you're on mute, so unmute your phone there. Oh, your uh, computer there. Unmute. Thanks. Thanks to everyone for being here. I um, am listening to all of this information, and I see that there needs to be some type of limited scope to what the commission will do in the first year because we can't address um, LGBT and uh, African Americans and Hispanic. We can't be everything to everybody in the beginning. And the um, diversity, uh, the racism, I'm sorry, the racism uh, statement on the website isn't really, um, part of, hmm, is, is a part of the diversity and uh, equity and inclusion commission from the standpoint is we could work on racism as a systemic health issue all by itself. And that would be an important area. And the reason that this DEI commission is being formed is to support the uh, systemic health issue. And it does more emphasis on African Americans than it does other communities. And that's because of what's been happening in the uh, political and uh, community uh, climate. So anyway, my point is we have to put some kind of a scope together for where we want to focus. And I was hoping that uh, we could focus a lot on Afri the African American community. And then when you talk about the study in Huntington Woods, 97% of the people that live in Huntington Woods are white. So it's like really great to say, oh, they all agree, but you know what? You can't live here. Our houses are too expensive. You can't get here. We don't have public transportation for you. And so I think to pay lip service to a community uh, resolution or a policy is going to be something that needs to be uh, worked on uh, very targeted as opposed to like taking a cannon and rolling it down the street. We want to uh, take a more focused approach. And there is a lot, there's a lot to tackle. So definitely you'll want to figure out what you guys want to focus on. We would definitely recommend that. Yeah, and one of the things right after we get, you know, uh, uh, questions for MML, we will ask commissioners for specifically, you know, what is it that you'd like to accomplish to hopefully narrow things down a little bit for you. Um, uh, but for the moment, let's, uh, let, let's while well, the experts are here, see if there are other uh, uh, questions people have for, for MML. Scott, I have another hand raised from uh, Councilman McDermott. Uh, thank you again. Um, so a couple of other questions. Uh, one of the barriers to entry in a lot of communities, and I don't necessarily know that that's a, a barrier to entry in, in our community, but, um, you know, Commissioner Sedman kind of touched on a little bit, is housing affordability and just overall community affordability. Um, we know that, unfortunately, we have a huge socioeconomic gap in this country and a, and a racial wealth gap uh, where individuals of color, African-Americans, Hispanics, Native Americans uh, in particular, uh, unfortunately, earn less, um, you know, dollar for dollar and a job that they have, or, you know, just unfortunately the economic and, and for, for women as well and, and single moms. Um, and we also know that um, the economic opportunities over the years due to discrimination, due to racism in the workplace, due to educational opportunities haven't been afforded to individuals of color, to, to women, to single moms. Um, what are things that other communities are doing to kind of tackle that affordability barrier to help diversify communities so that more people can move in and live there to increase affordable housing, to increase economic opportunity and mobility for you know, individuals of color, for women, for single moms, things like that. 
Yep, and I I would point you to, but we'll I'll get the information and share it with you. But like the city of Ferndale, I know they're active. Um, I want to say, well, Ann Arbor. Um, there's a couple others, but we definitely, again, as part of our inquiry service, we can get that information and, and get that to you. Wonderful. And then, the League of Cities has a national housing task force that our executive director is involved with as well, and we can get information to you. I really appreciate that. Thank you so much. And uh, definitely take a look at what Ferndale and Ann Arbor and some of the other municipalities have done. I guess my final question here too, um, you know, earlier I had mentioned that there are five communities in the state of Michigan, Detroit, Grand Rapids, Kalamazoo, Lansing, and Muskegon that have folded some side of citizen oversight with working with the police department into um, a lot of what they do. Some of these communities have separate civilian or citizen review boards, community review boards, and some of them may have folded them into their diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives or the boards themselves. Um, can you speak to any data or research for how that's, you know, been going in terms of you know, increasing diversity in the community, working to, on, you know, bias in law enforcement, things like that. Is there any numbers or data that you guys have from those municipalities on that? We can look for that. I'm not sure that we will have it, but I can find out if there's an organization that has that. Um, I do know Washtenaw County also has a similar um, review committee or committee that they work with. Uh, so we can find out, again, where we can get those statistics. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Okay. Are there any other questions uh, for our friends from the MML? If you have one, uh, just raise your hand so I can catch it for Scott. Uh, let's see. Angela Rimmel. So I have a question from Commissioner Rimmel. Hi. Um, yeah, I was curious. Uh, I have a background in child welfare. So um, and I've listened to a lot from Nadine Burke Harris about ACEs and things like that, um, stemming back to childhood and then working with those children um, because of their childhood traumas and generational trauma that goes on. So you know, that a lot of, um, you know, white people necessarily don't deal with as much of um, do you know communities in Michigan that have brought this here in any way or uh, anything about that at all? I, Kelly, I, Kelly may be able to speak to communities that have really focused on ACEs, uh, which are adverse childhood experiences. Um, the, the ACEs score work uh, it, is uh, the United Way, the United Way of Michigan um, and, and the local United Ways uh, this has been uh, something that they spearheaded and been um, and and really been leaders and champions in uh, in the state. Um, and and so I, I don't know about communities that have specifically pushed this forward, but I do know that local United Ways has spent a lot of time and energy in this space. And there's a huge, uh, well, I shouldn't say huge. There's a growing uh, contingent uh, in the body of research uh, in social in social services and social science uh, that that uses ACEs scores. As a way to uh, as as a way to uh, think about programming and to uh, and to funnel resources. So uh, my first my first reaction would be to make sure you're connecting with your local United Way. Um, and uh, Kelly may know something about communities that have that have that have used it uh, to, to some effect in their programming. Maybe. Yeah, but actually, I don't. I'm not familiar with the program at all. Well, that was helpful anyway, the United, looking into United Way. Um, Nadine Merck Harris is the is a Surgeon General of California. So I just checked out some podcasts and things like that and um, with her in it. But ACEs to me is a, is a very interesting place community-wise. Like I know a lot of this has focused on what we would do within uh, recruitment and retention. Uh, but I was thinking kind of community-wide um, what, what to do there. And I don't know if you would focus mainly in within the executive team first to bring diversity into that first and then, and then implement it into the city or if we're doing the whole, the community and within the executive team within the city. And I think that's something you guys get to decide. Commissioner Rimmel, is that all set? That's all I have. Thank you. 
Very good, thank you. Uh, next question comes from uh, Councilman Londo. President Hart, and thank you, Kelly and Selma. That was uh, some great information, and I'm um, hoping that you'll share that deck with uh, the administration, and maybe they can share it with us. So I was trying to jot down, like Councilman McDermott said, jot down as much as I could, uh, but I'm hoping that maybe you guys can share the deck with us. Um, so one thing I did pull out of there was, you know, 14 cities declared racism as a public health crisis, Westland being one of them, I'm proud of. Um, you said 145 nationwide. Um, how many of these communities, and I don't know if you know this answer, but how many communities have something similar to what we have uh, as a diversity advisory board or a diversity equity inclusion board? Um, it's, a, it's an interest. We actually wanted to answer that question. Uh, <laughs> we had that same question when we started. Um, and the, the, uh, the short answer is, is that there's a lot. Uh, the longer answer is that the terminology you use really matters. Um, so uh, the the Community Relations Commission in Grand Rapids could have the exact same scope as your DEI commission, uh, but you're called two different things. So um, and, and that body has been around and has morphed for you know over 50 years. So um, it, it 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 was it was sort of difficult to pinpoint um, you know who exactly is done. You know we probably could find out the DEI question, but um, these boards and commissions are not unusual. Um, and their scopes have changed over time uh, and the things that they focus on and the things that they look at. Um, I know uh, in some communities when, when those commissions were started, uh, redlining was a specific, uh, was a very specific thing that they were narrowing in on. Uh, today, COVID and health impacts are really specific things. So um, boards and commissions that deal with, um, that deal with racial equity and uh, community relations um, are not in the least bit, uh, are not in the least bit rare. They are, they are and I think, yeah, yeah. Oh, go ahead, Kelly. Oh, the city of Jackson, I think, would be the closest to what Westland has. However, they formed after you guys formed yours. Like, I think it was just in end of September or something. Great, thank you. Yeah, and to Thomas' point, you know, the private sector, there's a lot of this too. In my, in my private job, I won't mention it, but we have a called a diversity, diversity Advisory Board or DAB, and each market unit has a culture and inclusion committee. And I served on that committee. So that's kind of when I was talking about the events earlier about the various, uh, you know, Hispanic Heritage Month, Native American Heritage Month, Black History Month, yes. uh, LBGTQ. That's a lot of stuff that we focus on. Um, I mean, like for our job, it's, you know, it's usually event event driven, you know, food, we'll have food events, we'll have, um, you know, we'll decorate and different uh, for the month um, and then highlight employees. I thought that's kind of neat. Like you'll walk through the hallways and there's a, if it's Hispanic Heritage Month, there's, maybe three profiles of three employees that have uh, profiles on them and their background. So I thought that was kind of neat. Thanks, thanks again to both of you um, for your for your time and, and all the um, all the great data, data you showed us. Thank you. You're welcome. I would say too, Sterling Heights does um, what you're talking about doing with highlighting the various um, populations in the community. Thank you, Councilman. Uh, Scott, the next uh, hand I have raised comes from Councilwoman Rakowski. It's still morning, so good morning again. Um, mm -hmm. Kelly and Selma, thank you for such a wonderful presentation. Like my colleagues, I'm taking lots of notes. I would really um, personally appreciate maybe um, having some of your scripted information from each of your bullet points, because I'm sure I missed a whole bunch. Um, two of the things that really stuck out to me and I don't think it comes as a surprise is the education component. Um, when you spoke about Huntington Woods having their community book club and, and movie collaboration, um, I would be interested in knowing how they're making that accessible to everyone. Um, you know, when we're relying on libraries, um, sometimes there's a, a limit to um, how many people can check out a book or, or things like that. So I would love to know how they're getting um, the materials to the public, as well as who is facilitating the conversation once the book has been read or the film has been viewed. Um, additionally, I really um, loved hearing about Grand Rapids um, Youth Concerns Board. And I was curious if the um, commission was facilitating that or if that was coming from City Hall in general. And because um, I think it's that when you, you capture the um, ideas of the youth, it just catches on like wildfire, right? Because we're all so very invested 
and the lives of our children. And, and we just always want such a greater future for them. And so um, in Westland, we have a, a wonderful youth assistance program. Um, so I don't know if it fall, would fall with that, but just hearing, you know, that they're working with children um, seems to make so much sense. Just so, you know, I, I just love it. So um, those are just my two super standouts, but every, all, there's tons of information um, and I really appreciate it. And I'll be sure to go to the uh, DEI part of MML because I'm sure I'm just going to find way, way, way more information that um, the board will find useful. So thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, the um, I don't know the, your specific question of where it started. Um, the it, it, what we wrote down was that the school board, the city, and community leaders. So uh, I'm I'm guessing, and, and uh, I don't remember asking that question specifically when we talked about folks at Grand Rapids. Uh, the um, the that the Office of Children, Youth, and Families actually created an office. Um, which was staffed in in the administration uh, of 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 the city, and um, and that that's changed, and their scope has changed over time, and they've added additional programming. But um, uh, regardless, I think that uh, it was it was formalized in uh, that function was formalized in in city staff. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, Scott, uh, I don't see any other hands raised. I don't know if you want to do a call for the last question for the MML. Uh, yeah, we'll see if, if there was anything else. Um, and if not, we have two exercises left to, uh, to do before public comment. If, if, I'm, if, I, if I might, Scott, there was, uh, there was uh, one point um, that, uh, that, I wanted to, uh, that I wanted to know about Huntington Woods, uh, and it was in my notes, and, and forgive me because I didn't, I didn't talk about it when we were uh, when, when I was when I was presenting on it, uh, Huntington Woods is 95% white um, and has 5% uh, um, black, uh, indigenous, and people of color. So it is a uh, overwhelmingly white community. Um, and uh, there was one of the things that we noted, and it actually was one of the reasons we we chose them to highlight, is um, that in their anti-racism plan. Um, they, uh, they write about how the nation's demographics are changing and they, they go on to note that half of the U.S. will be minority white by 2045. We want to remain the preferred place to raise a family. Uh, we need a plan for a more sustainable future to be truly, to be a truly warm and inclusive community. Huntington Woods aspires to be known as a welcoming community to everyone who lives here, uh, might choose to live here in the future and anyone who spends time here. So uh, it is a, it, you know, we, we, we hear this question uh, as the league, we hear questions from communities that uh, have very little um, uh, racial diversity in their, um, in their communities quite often, like, why does this matter? Um, and uh, uh, if, you, if, you, if you can't get to it from a, from a moral place, um, you might be able to get to it from a, uh, from a prosperity place. In, in that uh, you, the, the, our world is changing and in order to in, engage in that world, um, you, you gotta, you have to be, you gotta update. Um, I, and and if, it, if you can't get to it from a moral place, um, you know, it's like there, there was a time where, where people didn't know anything about computers and in order to engage in the world, you needed to learn how to use a computer. You have to learn how to use a computer. And, and, and still that's even part of DEI and part of inclusion and making sure that folks who are not uh, necessarily technology literate are able to participate. Um, and I think that's the point uh, about being inclusive and bringing in those diverse perspectives so that your community can indeed prosper under, um, under a myriad of, of circumstances and situations, not just the one that you're living in right now. And Selma, I would add to that too, and see if you can't get there from a, play, a moral place, then get there from an economic place. And I'll take Ottawa County as an example their county administrators said they had corporations contact them and say, hey, if, if your um, talent pool isn't diverse, we're not going to bring our companies here or we're going to pull our companies out. And so look at it from an economic standpoint as well of why it's important. There's tremendous research about uh, the importance of diversity of thought uh, and innovation uh, the Harvard Business Review has uh, has lots of uh, content on this that uh, that is there really is an economic case 
uh, to be made for diversity and encouraging diversity within the Great. Well, Selma Kelly, thank you so much. Uh, certainly given a lot of uh, uh, a lot of uh, ideas for thought, and I'll summarize some of them in a little bit after um, uh, after we get through the uh, the next couple of exercises. But what what the next thing to do is that you know commissioners have asked some questions of uh, of uh, MML, but really we haven't heard yet from from commissioners who you know just recently appointed. Um, you know, you you volunteered to serve on the commission, and that means that you've agreed to uh, dedicate a good chunk of your time to help in this matter. And we want to know, uh, you know, what motivated you to uh, to volunteer? If there are partic particular things uh, that you'd like to see the commission accomplish, specific actions, uh, maybe some things that you've heard from MML or from uh, uh, council members earlier. Um, uh, that, that you want to see the commission uh, uh, accomplish. So what we'd like to do is have each of you give the, you know, give each of you the opportunity to share that perspective. Um, and again, I'll record some of the, uh, uh, some of the dialogue uh, to recap in just a moment, but um, uh, uh, you know, work through that and call on you probably individually as well. I think I have um, just looking at the folks here, most council, most commissioners are here, but not everybody. Um, okay, if I go through things uh, uh, alphabetically so everybody has a chance. Okay. It looks like uh, Commissioner El, El Manini and Commissioner Ford are not here. Um, so uh, so we'll jump down to uh, uh, Commissioner Guyton. Absolutely. Thank you. And I'm so excited to be part of the DEI Commission. Um, like uh, was mentioned earlier, I, I really like the idea of like building a foundation where equity is everywhere. Um, I also am really passionate about health and I really want to make sure that, you know, residents have the things that um, or, or just the, the city in general have the things in place that um, allow residents to be as healthy as possible. And a lot of times those are things that are not directly related to our health, such as um, our transportation um, policies and systems that, you know, just within our government. Um, so I'm, I'm really hoping to um, you know, use my voice and, and use uh, my education and my background um, to, to make a change in that area so that overall our, our, our residents, you know, are, are, are healthy and um, are, are represented as well. All right, thank you. Uh, Commissioner uh, Rimmel. Hi, yeah, um, I wanted to get started in this. I, I had taken an interest in the field in general and had gone back to get my master's in industrial and organizational psychology. So I completed that. And um, once I saw, you know, obviously the state of the world right now, which is heightened because of the media and being able to see what's going on due to recordings and things like that. Um, you know, once I saw this opportunity, I wanted to be able to use what I've learned in the past and continue to learn how to, how to change and affect um, <clears throat> make changes within the community that I live in. Um, so I can see, you know, more people in, of color in the community, more diversity, more equity, more inclusion. Um, you know, this is what I've been um, interested in for a while. And I'm very excited to have this opportunity and, and, and meet the rest of the commissioners and work with them um, to see the city grow into what we want it to fully be. Great, thanks so much, uh, Commissioner uh, Sanchez. Hi, I'm really excited to be part of the commission. Yo, I'm Tani, and I'm really excited. And this is a really big challenge to me. So, and this is a big um, step for you to build this community. And I'm more than willing to learn from you and more history and more about get over it. Like, that's all. All right, great. Had a little tr trouble hearing you, but we sure heard the passion. So, uh, so oh, yes, yeah. I am. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, uh, Commissioner Sedman. Hi. Um, I got involved and interested in this commission because of the uh, statement where uh, racism is a public health crisis. 
And that's what got me interested. It wasn't because of seniors or dis disabled people. Uh, it was mostly because of racism. And I am looking forward to working with everybody, but I'm a little overwhelmed with everything that I'm hearing because I would prefer to have a, some type of a scope. And what I would like to see is I would like to see that uh, our accomplishment would be if we could get people to live here and work here. And I think that that would be a major accomplishment. All right, thank you. Uh, uh, Commissioner Thomas. Hello, that would be me. Hi, I'm looking forward to uh, adding my uh, wisdom and um, moral insights to the commission. And I'm looking forward to uh, for the opportunity to make um, living in the city of Westland a better place for all. Thank you. All right, great. And I think uh, Commissioner Warren, um, uh, last one. Okay, am I unmuted? You are, Mr. Warren, we can hear you. All set. Oh, okay, in my uh, 45 plus years of living in the city of Westland, and particularly in the predominantly uh, Afro-American part of the city, my history has been a long struggle in trying to fulfill the, the desires of the predominantly black community down here. Uh, and also in my personal life, a long struggle of working on EEO jobs, as equal opportunity jobs, quota jobs, et cetera, and, 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 and dealing the raw blunt face of racism in the job market. And also, and listening to my elders down here, some of them who came up from the South, a lot of them in their nineties, and listen to the history of, of Nankin Township as it transformed into the city of Westland and living in a lot of mayors here who were not so indicative of, of, of embracing the black community. So elections have consequences. We have to understand that. Maybe four years now, this council may not be there. Then the mayor may not be there, okay? But the struggle continues. So I would ask the commissioners, find some of the elder Afro-Americans within the community so they can give you a sense of the history so that you're not starting from day one or from basically your college educated background. So you can get a sense of people who actually lived the life and lived under Jim Crow and felt the pain and the anguish and the hope that some of us younger folk will be able to carry the struggle a little further on so that we can um, have this truly uh, go into this building pot that we call America. In other words, form it into a more perfect union. Thank you. All right, thank you all commissioners. Um, what I'd like to do now is uh, share my screen and what I, um, uh, uh, what we'll do is um, sharing. Oh, having a problem sharing, so I'll just read uh, uh, read things. It's only a couple of a uh, uh, couple of slides, uh, so it shouldn't shouldn't be a problem. But um, uh, we've gotten feedback from council, from the MML, and from the. Um, uh, uh, commissioners themselves around, uh, you know, the variety of things that we had uh, uh, talked to related to DEI today. And um, I'll do a quick summary of them and then I'll turn it over to council to again, walk through um, uh, and have each of you comment on now that you've gotten additional information from, uh, from things, you know, what, what are the things that would really uh, 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 strike you as priorities that you'd like to see for the, uh, uh, for the commission? Um, heard a couple of commissioners say, you know what, if we could narrow things down, that would be helpful, particularly in the first year. And so, um, uh, and, and I'll get this out to, uh, uh, to everybody, um, uh, uh, later on. But the feedback from council at the beginning of the meeting was, you know, reviewing policies, union contracts, and other areas that might have a hidden bias um, within the group. We also heard uh, uh, to tell, you know, tell me what I don't know. Um, council really wants to listen and hear from commission, their advice, their uh, uh, areas where, you know, council might be a bit blind to. 
uh, attract and retain quality individuals of all races within the city, particularly in public uh, uh, safety. Um, we also heard to build on success of Black History Month, uh, bring awareness to other groups, uh, percent, set a percentage goal for hiring based on census data uh, so that the workforce reflects the ethnicity of the, uh, of the city. Um, potential for citizen oversight uh, to work with police, similar to Grand Rapids, Detroit, uh, Muskegon, there were a couple of others in that example. Um, and then facilitate education for legislative administration uh, uh, initiatives within the community as well. So it's kind of just a quick summary of the, uh, of the first exercise from this morning. Then MML had some uh, uh, things that they had as far as actions. Um, uh, some resources included National League of Cities, uh, Kellogg Foundation and their own mml.org uh, slash uh, DEI, uh, where there is an awful lot of resources and I'd encourage everybody to look at that. Um, they did a cultural competency program, an organizational assessment, an internal review of things like compensation, uh, and then community outreach through articles and radio shows and podcasts. And then finally, the training programs such as Walking While Black uh, and Love is the Answer uh, were a couple of other things that they did internally. Within the other communities, we heard about hunting, Huntington Woods and anti-racism plan, uh, um, engage or incorporating DEI into the master plan. Uh, which I found very interesting. Um, bias training for staff and residents, uh, the community-wide book club, uh, workforce, and then within Grand Rapids, the workforce div diversity policy, uh, the People of Color Collaborative, uh, racial equity plan, uh, and human rights ordinance. Um, and then the dot documented history of the um, uh, racial equity here plan uh, that had kind of the timeline of race. Uh, the last thing that we heard was uh, Grand Rapids uh, incorporating uh, equity into their strategic plan and putting some teeth on uh, uh, on some uh, uh, various things. So, so that's a quick summary of that. And then, you know, the feedback from com commissioners kind of, you know what, that's an awful lot to tackle if we can narrow our scope for the first year that would help us be more successful. Um, uh, systems and government that contribute to health such as transportation was one of the topics that was brought up. Uh, ultimately getting people to want to live and uh, uh, work in Westland was an outcome that one, one commissioner had, addressing racism in the job market and engaging the community to understand the history within uh, uh, Westland, which sounded kind of similar to what the uh, Grand Rapids um, uh, initiative was as well. So those uh, 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 were the topics that were brought up today. And again, we'd like to turn it over to council at this time to uh, see if there's some things that uh, uh, you can, uh, advice you can give in order to narrow that focus even further. Um, uh, you know, thinking about the next year, the next couple of years, if there are specific uh, outcomes, specific uh, uh, action items that you would like for, uh, uh, for commission to take. Uh, give them that advice so that then when they get together in, um, uh, in January, they can help chart that course for themselves uh, for the upcoming year. So, um, so, so that's the, uh, what we'd like to do. Um, uh, and again, we'll just go through things in, a, uh, in alphabetical order again, if that's okay. Uh, so starting with um, uh, uh, Council Member Godbaugh, are there particular things that you'd like to see the commission accomplish within the first, first couple of years? Um. Yeah, back in uh, 2017, we passed our uh, Human Relations Ordinance, Non-Discrimination Ordinance um, within the city. And, you know, maybe taking a look at that and making sure it's as inclusive as it should be and could be. Uh, and, and we, sir, we, say that again, the Human what Ordinance? The Human Relations Non-Discrimination ordinance that we passed in 2017 uh, in its uh, chapter 54 of our, our ordinances. Uh, so there's intent, there's definitions, uh, talks about housing practices, public accommodation practices, uh, employment practices. So it's, you know, we tried to, when we drafted it back in 2017, we tried to, to make it as as inclusive as possible for all groups, uh, not only based off of uh, uh, ethnicity, but based on sexual orientation, based off of, um, you know, lifestyle preference. Uh, so the, uh, you know, that ordinance is already in existence. And so 
I, th I think building off of that can be a, a key to uh, this commission. Uh, and at least it gives them some place to start and see what already has been done. And then moving forward, what we need to do to improve it. Um, as well as, you know, the, the one thing that, that hit me was not only, uh, you know, and I know that part of the, the our employee practices are training on diversity, training on a lot of different topics, uh, and maybe look at how we can take some of that internal training and make it external to our residents so that, you know, we get more people on the same page. Uh, you know, it's nice to have an internal look at, uh, you know, what we're doing to uh, broaden everyone's uh, perspectives and acceptance uh, and maybe looking at how we can take that and turn it outward so that, you know, we can get our whole community looking at being more accepting. Um, just, a, just a thought. All right, thank you. Uh, Council President Hart, next. Hey, thank you, Scott. And uh, I'll try and be as brief as possible. I, Councilman Godbout, again, uh, great lead in. Uh, so it sets the stage pretty well. I also want to thank uh, Commissioner Sedman. You, you actually brought it up. Um, we need to be focused a little bit, kind of in this large. We, ha we have an awful lot on our plate. And as we sat here and as we brainstormed, we, we started to really think about all the things that we're passionate about and things that we see that need to be fixed. And they all need to be fixed. But I kind of look at this as kind of a battlefield, right? Uh, so we didn't parachute directly into Berlin. You know, uh, we, we landed the northern shores of France and then we had strategic battles along the way in order to we finally won the war. And I think it's important that we do that, too. Uh, we need to have strategic uh, vision here and move in a sensible way as we start to move from this kind of internal review. Uh, I think from a city perspective, then we go to a community perspective and then we start to move that out. All right, so I think these the, the, our, our goal was for, of course, to kind of take a look internally about what our policies are, what our procedures are, are they in keeping into the best practices, goals and ideals of diversity, equity, inclusion. And if there's something broke there, um, it, yeah, you are charged with letting us know that it's broken uh, so that we can work on getting it fixed. Uh, I think the next step to that is then working into wrapping the community as we, as we now we take forward, we fixed our house. Now we move to the neighborhoods. And then after we conquer the neighborhoods, if you will, and we, and we win those decisive battles along the way, we start to move to these higher, higher order things that we start to work on. Um, so you're not going to be able to have a really dynamic team if you say we're going to end racism in the state of, in the United States as the as the Westland DEI board. And that's a little excessive, I know, but it's also to be able to keep your head uh, put together, get some perspective and know that we need to move in iterative, smart steps. And if we miss an integral or excuse me, an important step along the way, we're not going to be able to develop that experience set. We're not going to be able to develop that comfort and we're not going to be able to earn that credibility as we move to those next pieces along the way. So when we're speaking in scope of prioritization, I think it's important we take those steps. And then if we do so, uh, we can start to really make some some impact over the over the years to come. I don't see this board as being a temporary solution. This board is a permanent fixture. And as we're a permanent fixture, we'll have permanent work to do, but our permanent work will be effective as long as we move sensibly along the way. So that's my opinion. Thank you. All right, thank you. And uh, uh, let me see, Councilman uh, Lando, please. Scott, and again, thank you to your team. and. Um, and Selma from the MML for all the work that you guys put in. Uh, this has been a really eye-opening and uh, great experience for, for myself and I know my colleagues. Um, I appreciate everyone's attention to detail and everyone um, bringing so many great ideas. And it's kind of funny, uh, President Hart always has to go last at our council meeting. So going first and second, now he's able to actually say a lot of the things that we usually steal from him. So great job, President Hart, uh, and for bringing up, that was a great analogy, bringing up the battlefield. Um, you know, I kind of wrote some notes down, so I'll just kind of be quick. Stepping on kind of what they just spoke, or my colleagues just spoke about, um, you know, Commissioner Seven brought up a scope and having a scope. Um, just want to mention this, these are just ideas. This, you know, we're not really saying, hey, you have to go this direction, you have to go that direction. 
this was a visioning session where we all came together collectively, throw ideas out there, and give you guys some direction on where to go. Um, but it, this is your board. This isn't our board. This is your board. And your ideas and vision will assist us in our decision making uh, in relation to diversity, equity, inclusion right here in the city of Westland. So again, thank you all. Um, you guys should all be very proud. Um, this is uh, historic, I think, and it's you all should be very proud that you're uh, you're serving on this board. And um, you know, 85,000 residents really appreciate all of your all of your um, all of you serving. Um, and then you know, Scott did a great job summarizing everything. Um, I'm hoping I'm sure you'll send something out to us and everybody to take a look at all that. Again, I was trying to write things down. Um, so thank you so much for that. Um, and again, you know, there's no huge rush, like uh, Council President Hart said. Um, you know, you can start picking away at little things here and there, but a great example is look at Grand Rapids. Remember that timeline that they showed? I mean, this is going back a long, long time. They've made a commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. So um, once we start, let's hit the ground running and, and tackle one issue move on to the next one. And um, again, thank you all very much. I'm proud of each and every one of you. Um, and I'll yield, I'll yield the floor to uh, the next council member. Thanks again, everyone. All right, sounds great. Uh, uh, council member uh, McDermott, next, please. Well, thank you, Scott. Thank you for the presentation today. Thank you for moderating for us. And also thank you to um, Kelly and to Selma for your participation and your input and the invaluable information um, that you gave us today. So I'll echo the sentiments of what my colleagues have said. You know, this is really going to be a puzzle. And when you put a puzzle together, you don't just throw all the pieces together at once. You, you kind of figure out what pieces need to go where and what needs to come first. Um, you know, just some of the things that I would like to see long term in the scope of what uh, this board is going to do. You know, as I mentioned, having some kind of goal or quota system to actually enforce more diverse hiring here in the city of Westland and to, and to really force diversity within our workforce. Uh, certainly we want the, the most qualified um, applicants, but we want applicants that are, and people that ultimately get hired that are reflexive of the community. So if we have a community that is 20% African-American or maybe 5% Arab American or Hispanic in the next um, census, when the next census set of census data comes out, we want our, I think our community's workforce to be reflexive of that so that people in the community feel included and feel like you know, they are a part of the community, they could work for the community that they live in. So I think some kind of tangible uh, goal is set for what we want our community's workforce to, to look like. Maybe it's tied to the census data or whatever uh, our DEI board members come up with, I think is a, is a good scope. Uh, looking at ways that we can continue to increase economic opportunity, housing affordability for uh, not only, you know, individuals of color, but for also people in the LGBTQA community, for single moms, uh, single dads uh, within the community looking to increase economic opportunity and, you know, housing opportunities, um, increasing economic mobility within the city, uh, I think is something that should long term, maybe not in the next year or two, but long term should be in the scope of I, what DEI does. And that's, you know, something that I hope our, our DEI members are, you know, want to, are interested in taking a look at. And then I also mentioned the citizen oversight uh, piece, working with the police department to end uh, to work on issues of, you know, implicit bias, bias within in law enforcement. Uh, I know that our, our department, our chief has been really proactive in taking a number of steps on that already. Uh, you know, we have that community dashboard. We have uh, a number of training programs and initiatives that the chief and in the department, you know, all the officers have really done a great job um, spearheading and getting out in front of. But, you know, I would, I would like to see, you know, potentially DEI include that in their scope um, as well. And then, you know, I just also want to, you know, make sure that, you know, we as a council are open. So this is, as, as Councilman Lando said, this is their board. This is really um, their responsibility and, you know, their undertaking, but any way that, you know, we can help in any way that um, as a council, we can, you know, be proactive members uh, with you. We'd love to be included um, in the process, but ultimately this is, you know, going to be their initiative and, and, and their scope to, to really draft out and, you um, you know, carry through. So uh, again, really appreciate Scott, Kelly, Salma, and then all of our DEI members who signed up to do this. It's a, it's a really big and grave undertaking. So thank you uh, for taking the time to sign up with this board and, and really bring your voice into the conversation. So really appreciate it. Thanks everybody. Great, thank you. Uh, uh, Council member uh, uh, Rakowski next, please. Thank you, Scott. And thank you for facilitating today's discussion. Um, and thank you to all of our DEI members who um, are in attendance today. 
I think it's very important that you recognize that this is your opportunity. Um, all of your council members have been elected um, to represent, but now we have this opportunity to have more voices at the table. So um, I want to really reserve, I think I've shared a lot of what my hopes and expectations are, but I want to reserve that at this point. All that I would ask is that um, you use SMART goals. So you have specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and timely goals um, that'll set you up for success. It doesn't mean that goals have to happen in 30, 60, 90, one year in, you know, increments. You can certainly have long range goals. Um, but I think if we, you utilize um, something that will give you parameters and, and measures of success, um, that'll help you be more successful. Um, and then as a council, at least as myself, and I can only speak for myself, um, I do want you to know that we are here to help you implement your vision and we stand behind you and we applaud you and we thank you. Um, you know, I think some of the information that's been shared like by Mr. Warren is that um, we do need the stories of our residents. And if you um, have that opportunity to share the story of our residents with the rest of our community so that we can all learn together and all understand, that would be greatly appreciated. So when you, um, if you, if you undertake something like the cultural awareness months that we're sharing those um, experiences from members of those communities so that the rest of us can benefit from their experience and as a community grow to be better. So good luck. Thank you. I look forward to seeing your success um, and I'm fully behind you. All right, great. Uh, uh, thank you for that. Um, Mayor Wild, did you wanna add anything? Thank you, Scott. And um, thank you everybody for, uh, for your, your comments um, throughout the meeting here today. So I, I think just the, the, the things for me is that um, to be my goal, and I would encourage the council to, is that um, we shared a lot today, but I think we need to, to step back and, and let the DEI board uh, work organically on this. You know, they, they've, they've heard a lot and each of them have, have a passion inside them that made them want to, uh, to get involved with this. So I think that we need to, to kind of let them uh, work amongst themselves. I, I like Ms. Edmonds' ideas that, that we should prioritize. And um, so perhaps the board can put together some uh, short-term, mid-term, long-term goals. Um, and then I think at the end of the day, just my administration, uh, the the um, the city council members, uh, the, the clerks on here today, uh, so I know he's listening too, is that you know each of us, we don't have anybody here from, uh, from the, the court, but I think each of us just need to be open to uh, the recommendations that, that come out of, out of this DEI commission. So um, um, not to put them on the spot, but I I'm really kind of intrigued by Ms. Uh, Guyton's, uh, her, her um, passion and the work that she does for the state of Michigan in this field as far as health, um, because I think that that's something that it's easy to overlook um, I think in this, in this, uh, on this topic, we it's easy to focus on hiring practices and and uh, some other issues. But I think the health of the community and the role that this plays in the health of the community is something that's easy to overlook. But may at the end of the day, may be the most important piece of this. And then uh, with uh, Commissioner Rimmel, with with her work that she's doing in this area with with children, uh, foster children, and adopted kids um, too. Um, I think that that's something that uh, is gonna come out of this commission too, that I think is gonna be worthwhile for us to take a look at. So that's all I have, Scott, back to you. Thank you. Well, well, great, we do appreciate that. And um, I've got some summary thoughts, just been taking notes here. I'll, I'll distribute that out to uh, uh, to you know be dispersed with those uh, attending today. Um, uh, but at, at this point, I just wanna say thank you to everybody. Um, uh, it, it's been a wonderful experience just uh, uh, listening and learning an awful lot from, uh, from MML. And uh, with that, um, I'll turn it over to uh, Council President Hart for, uh, uh, for public comment, I believe. 
Thank you, Scott. All right, at this time, what we'll do is we'll uh, invite any comment from the public. Uh, so understand that this is not a Q&A session. Uh, this is your opportunity to go ahead and ex uh, provide more comment. Uh, and this will be for the council to uh, consider and deliberate as well as the commissioners to consider and deliberate uh, as they proceed to move on with their new duties. Uh, to go ahead and comment, uh, your comments will be limited to the statutory three minutes that we use at all of our study sessions as well as our city council meetings. And of course, uh, appropriate behavior and decorum is always expected. And, and we, we, we don't expect anybody to get outside of those lines today. But if you do, uh, I'll go ahead and end you abruptly. Uh, so to go ahead and use that, uh, please on your Zoom app, uh, you can use the raise your hand feature. So you hit the raise hand feature and then I'll be able to recognize you. And once I recognize you, well, IT will activate your, your ability to speak and then you'll go ahead. So at this time, do I have any uh, any comments or any questions, or excuse me, any comments from the uh, from the public? Okay, so see none. So I'll do a second call. Are there any comments? There we go. We got some hands raised. It took a minute. Uh, so the first I have is Katie Dover Taylor. Uh, there we are. It just came up. I couldn't see it all up front. So Katie, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Can you all hear me? I sure can. You go right ahead. Wonderful. Thank you so much for recognizing me to speak. Um, I'm honored to speak with all of you this morning. I'm here um, on behalf of the Westland Public Library. Um, I have a personal passion for DEI and I've been doing work in this field within my own profession um, for the past few years um, as a member of the Public Library Association Association Task Force on Equity, Diversity, Inclusion, and Social Justice. So I hope that you will please consider the library as a resource in this work. Please consider uh, me personally as a resource in this work. Um, I wanted to address um, a couple of um, board member and um, council comments in particular. Uh, first, I just wanted to say thanks so much to Kelly and Selma. The Michigan Municipal League, I think, is going to be an excellent partner for this work. And I'm really grateful for the presentation and, and all that they were able to share this morning. Um, uh, Commissioner Sedman, I really liked what you had to say about this, the centrality of racism and the importance of dealing with racism specifically. Um, in the work that we've done um, with librarians, um, one of the things that we think of is a race and approach. So um, people aren't just black. They may be black and senior. They may be black and disabled. They may be black and LGBTQ um, and parts of, of each of those communities. You know, people aren't just a single identity category. Um, so what we do is we use a race first approach to sort of um, think about racism and how important it is, but also move forward understanding there's other intersections of identity. Um, Council member Rukowski, um, I love that you mentioned the one book, one community um, project. And obviously I, I hope that you'll consider the library as a partner in that pro uh, project and, and we'd be happy to, to talk with you more about that. Um, Commissioner Warren, um, I really appreciate your comments about elders in the black community and um, really paying attention to the folks who have been in Westland for decades, um, who, who this work affects. Um, and I, I hope that, that you'll consider um, the potential there for maybe an oral history project or something like that to really capture the the um, capture those voices and those amazing stories um, and make sure that they're available for the next generation. Um, and then my final comment um, is is based off something that um, Council Mem uh, Council President Hart said, which is um, I like the idea of starting with an internal focus and then broadening out. But I think that that first step actually has to be building the team that you have, building that commission and their ability to work together um, as, as the, the initial seed of the work. So I, I really look forward to seeing where the commission goes. I thank you again for, for acknowledging me to speak and um, I'm grateful to see this work happening in Westland and grateful to, to do it in the library. So thank you. Thank you, Katie, appreciate it. Uh, our next hand raise comes from Miss Lori Wilson. So, Miss Wilson, I have activated you. Are you there? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? I can. Please proceed. Good morning. Good afternoon to all. And thank you for uh, answering my call. To all the commissioners, thank you for your volunteer work. To Miss 
Warren and to Mr. Tucker, thank you for your information. It was truly enlightening. I'd like to see truly see how it's going to work in our community, in our city, even if we don't adopt a lot of uh, your initiatives and your ideas. There are others out there that you probably can and most likely will be helping us along with. Uh, to the mayor, thank you for seating your, your commission. To the council members, thank you for adopting this commission and putting it together. Ms. Stedman, yes, you are correct. I believe it should start as a Black Lives initiative. Also, what Ms. Dover said over, Ms. Dover Taylor said over, not just making it Black, but uh, bringing in all the rest of the entities that encompass Black communities. Mm -hmm. um, I live in a historic district down here, but there is uh, a lot of things that need to be discussed. I will be getting with Mr. Warren as he is, he, Miss Elnor Ford and Miss Lena Nichols, who are also on the commission, who unfortunately today aren't on your uh, calls. I will be getting with them to start this oral for the history of our area and the things that these people have gone through. I am also the secretary of the West Southeast Westland Homeowners Association. So any help that I can get in putting this together would be awesome. Thank you very much. Excuse me. Thank you, Lori. <laughs> All right. The hold on. I mean, I had to change this real quick. There we are. Uh, the next up, we have uh, our very own uh, Chief Dedrusic. Chief, are you there? I am. Can you hear me, Mr. Council President? Yes, Chief. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, sir. I just really quickly wanted to say that you know I'm listening here today, and and I encourage the uh, DEI board to feel free to contact me directly with any questions they may have regarding uh, law enforcement as they work forward with uh, this program, and I I be happy to be a part of it. That's all I wanted to say. So thank you. Thank you, Chief. All right. Uh, at this time, are there any more? Uh, if there's anybody else from the public who'd like to offer comment, please raise your hand. If there's anybody else from the public, use the Zoom app to raise your hand. This will be my final call. Any other comments from the public on today's topic? You please raise your hand. All right. I see no other hands raised, so we'll pl close public comment kind of wrap up today. So uh, again, um, I'd like to thank everybody who came out, really. Um, this was really important. We'll start off with Kelly and Soma. Thank you for coming out and leading us in discussion and providing a lot of these wonderful slides and topics for us. I think it's some really good food for thought for not only our DEI commissioners, but also the council as a whole and the administration. So I know that the mayor will be able to take that back and share that with his team. And if you could at some point, either via Scott or via the mayor, if we could have access to those slides too, I think the council would like to have those slides. Um, it might even be public. Uh, I'd like to, excuse me, also the DEI commission as well. I think uh, giving them access to those slides and potentially the public as well. So it had some good information there. I really liked uh, kind of the follow-up uh, slide that you have of all the things, the action items of things we need to think about. Uh, I, I took a picture of it on my phone, but I know I'll get the slides, so that's important. Um, to Scott, uh, thank you so much for leading this discussion today. I'd also uh, thank Alicia as well, who I know has been working in the background with you to try and put this together. So thank you both for leading us in this discussion. It's vitally important. Um, to our DEI commissioners, thank you for volunteering. Thank you for becoming a part of this most important work. And thank you for being here today. Um, the council looks to you heavily for your input and your guidance and your perspective. We're not here to tell you what to do. You're here, quite frankly, to tell us what you think needs to be done. And we're ready to listen. And I know the mayor is ready to listen as well in the administration. So you're charged with a great responsibility, but it's very much appreciated by all of us. It's good work. It's good work to do. Uh, mayor, thank you uh, to yourself and the administration members that have helped put this together. And uh, finally, I thank you all to the council members who have showed up today and were involved. I know we voted on this unanimously and I know we are, all of our hearts are in this and we're gonna support everybody as much as we can. And with, finally, I'll thank the residents that did show up today, those that listened and those are being part of what the, we've been moving forward and helping us support the DEI board. Uh, with that, I'll go ahead and close today's meeting. 
Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone who came. Please enjoy the rest of your weekend and have a great afternoon.